All right. Yeah. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, being here this evening. We do appreciate it. We will go ahead and begin our workshop at this time. Uh, we're going to start tonight with public comment. I don't know that anyone has signed up. Did we have anyone that uh, was wanting to sign up for public comment? All right. Well, we'll keep moving. <clears throat> so tonight's uh, agenda will start with the business side, and then we'll move more into the academic side in the second half <laughs> of tonight's meeting. Um, we'll receive a lot of information on the on the business side and on the academic side. Dr. Hines will kind of guide us through the conversation, but um, there'll be a few of the topics that are just for your information, and there'll be a few topics where we're looking for some guidance as to which direction you would like to see us go. Um, and if you want more information, and we'll make sure to um, preface uh, every presentation with what we'll need from you at the end of it uh, moving forward. But we'll start. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rice. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Knoll. Uh, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll, uh, it is my honor to welcome Jennifer Barton and Amy Campbell here this evening. They're with TASB HR Services. And each year they work with the district in looking at our pay plan, and they make sure that we're, we stay competitive in the market. And uh, they have a nice presentation here for us this evening with, with some models that uh, for us to consider. And I'd also like, like to thank Mr. Ray Sanders for joining us in those meetings we have with TASB. I know it's a, it's a, it's a long process, and we really appreciate you working with us. Very so informative. That time, at that time, I'd like to turn it over. Okay, I think we're good. Everybody can hear me? Yes, All right, perfect. Uh, good evening, school board members, Dr. Noll. Thank you for having us here uh, this evening. I am Jennifer Barton from TASB HR Services, and Amy is with us. Um, you've seen Amy, but she's kind of giving the reins over, so I will be doing our presentation tonight. And so, as Mr. Rice said, yes, we are very excited to uh, share our paint maintenance with you this evening because really it is a celebration of how competitive um, Conroe has remained within the market, and we're going to see a lot of that tonight. And so, we're just really excited. And we want to give you a lot of kudos for making big efforts towards that and keeping um, your employees well paid and happy, hopefully. So because y'all are very experienced in uh, the process and in everything that we do every year, we're just going to kind of briefly go over compensation. Uh, we don't need to spend a whole lot of time on that unless you have questions, uh, just because y'all pretty much understand the process. <coughs> but remember, whenever we do our pay maintenance every year, that you know, we have a few steps that we go through. Uh, so we do data collection for the district. We look at our paid data, the processes that we're looking at. Um, we have those kickoff discussions. Uh, you know, typically what we do is we really just want to hear the needs of the district and any goals or strategic initiatives that you're trying to meet for the school year. So it's very typical conversation. We work closely, closely with our HR department to make sure that we are addressing all of your needs each year. Um, we also go into our market pay review. So typically our data comes in in December this year. We definitely were at December because of House Bill 3 and all of the changes within the market. So um, we review the market data and we match common jobs and our analysts help a lot with that work. And then once we have all of that data gathered, we start our analysis. Um, and we look at our <coughs> models and we build them, you know, basically for improvement. We make sure that our pay structures are competitive. We adjust employee pay. We look at um, internal equity. We make sure that jobs are competitive in the market externally. And we go through all of our processes to make sure that the whole pay plan is competitive and that we've addressed those groups that are of concern with the district. Remember that our market pay strategy, that our market rate is, you know, the target basically. And so we say that anywhere within 90% to 110% is really jobs are within the market. You know, our outliers may be at that 120 and that 80%, so above and below. And so those are the ones that we always discuss. And we talk about addressing if they're way below market and then if they're above market, just taking note of why that could be. Um, there's lots of different reasons why pay may fall outside of the 90 to 110%. It could be value of the district for the job. Um, it could be years of experience, all of those things. So it's not necessarily bad. We just want to make sure that we are discussing it and everybody's aware of why that is. So here are your market districts. They're very similar to years past. Um, you see Conroe competes with the majority of your Houston districts here. Um, you have some that are about your size. You have some that are very small compared to Conroe. And then, of course, you have some that are very large. We're fortunate that we work with a lot of districts here in the Houston area, so they do complete our salary survey. So that's why you see that everybody uh, completed the survey and we had lots of data to use. Um, and so that's a positive thing. 
Other market sources that we look at, uh, we look at statewide districts with enrollment of 50,000 or more for directors and above. Um, that is something that we do every year with Conroe. We also look at the Economic Research Institute or ERI for the Houston metro area as well as comp analysts. And so when we use those two uh, <laughs> third party providers for data, we use them whenever we're looking for non-school market. So here's the good stuff. So looking at um, market salaries for teachers, the blue is the local market median and then Conroe is the orange. And so you can see that, you know, there's a little bit of area there maybe where you've um, fallen below, but overall um, you have rain, remained pretty competitive. And considering that in the Houston area, you've had some districts this last year gave very high percentage of raise, raises because they had to. Um, you know, we kind of say it's the wild, wild west of what raises were this last year. So it could be anywhere from 8% and then you could have districts that were giving 1% and everything in between. But all things considered, really Conroe has remained pretty com um, competitive within the market. Would you, would you, and it's better. Would I'm you sorry. go back a slide? Sure. Okay, go to the forward. The next slide may yes. answer the question. Sure. I'm sorry. You're fine. This one? No, no, keep going. Go forward. <laughs> sorry. One more. Got it. All right, you're back on track. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, it's okay. Not a problem. <clears throat> so we can see the visual here, but I think it's better in numbers, right? Yeah, that's that exactly helps. my point. Yes. I mean, those those markers were two thousand dollars delta, so it looked like it was pretty big there. Mm -hmm. But you turn over here, it's just ninety eight percent. It's not Absolutely. big at all. Nothing. Correct. So that's what I was looking for. So thank you. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Uh, you're just ahead of the game, so that's all right. Uh, so Sound you know. Like my mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're, we're getting there. Too. All right. So looking at zero years, right? We're starting about, uh, you know, your your basically your job fair number, right? Um, so Conroe ISD offered at fifty five five this year, and you can see that you're even with market. So the local market median is fifty five five. So that's a great, um, really being able to pull in those teachers into your district. And then looking at your 5, 10, and 15, and 20 years, those are the years that we benchmarked for. So we do see that there was a little dip there at 5 and 10. But the dollar difference, even though it is $1,322 and $701, it is um, not necessarily where we want to be, but it's not terrible either. Um, and so those are things that we can address very easily through the pay maintenance. Um, and then you can see at 15 and 20 years that you're even with market. Any questions on that table? Yes, sir. Just real quick. So this is just salary. This is not total compensation. This Correct. is we, just salaries. Yeah, it is base salaries. Mm -hmm. Insurance and so forth, how much competitive we are there. That makes up that difference yeah, pretty quick. That's why I wanted to make sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <coughs> Any other questions on this table? All right. The other thing that we look at is teaching area stipends. And so these are the stipends that we would offer teachers in the district for critical need areas. Um, and so the Conroe ISD offers a general master's degree for $1,000 or $1,800, and the median is $1,000. Um, they do not at this time offer secondary math and science, but they do <coughs> offer special education self-contained for $2,000, which is at the market median, as well as bilingual, there are above at $4,500. And we always say you want to put as much money as you can into bilingual. Um, it's almost becoming that with special education teachers these days, too. So right now, the teaching, um, teaching area stipends that you're offering are competitive, which will help with not only recruitment, but retention of those teachers in those more critical need areas. Are we having any shortfalls in those areas, though? I mean, I see you're saying that we're stifling to zero the secondary math and secondary science. But, Dr. Sharples, are we falling short as far as filling those positions? I think we're getting more and more challenged each year as we get closer mid-summer on. I think we're really strong right after the job fair and we hire, but as, as other students have hired, it gets more challenging closer to the start of school in those areas. Looking at our other um, exempt groups, so we're looking at administrative business, administrative education, and then our other teachers that are on the um, AP skill or administrative professional skills. Um, so we're looking at their market pay, and overall, again, you're looking very competitive, especially in your administrative education group. Uh, you know, those are like your assistant principals, principals, all of those directors and those type of positions. But overall, you are very competitive. And again, it just goes to your efforts of making sure that your employees are receiving those general pay increases every year, that we're adjusting pay for individuals and individual groups. Um, and so this is good news here. For your non-exempt or your hourly workers, we always are concerned on not only about where their pay is for, you know, 
to other employees, but also the midpoints, but we really think about starting rates. And as you can see, your, your non-exempt is looking really great, especially those starting rates. You can see that um, they're either even or above market for those pay grade minimums there to market and that you, you know, you're doing very well um, overall. And I know that there's been a lot of efforts to make sure that your hourly workers are compensated well. Um, bus drivers are always a concern and we made sure to address them um, this year to make sure that they are competitive and using some strategies to be able to recruit and retain those particular um, employees as well as aides and those type of, of people. That's what I was going to ask you uh -huh. is um, do you do you pull out paraprofessionals at all? Are they are they in here somewhere? Yes. Paraprofessional pay. Are you talking about like classroom paraprofessionals? Yes. yes. So if you look at instructional support, that's where your classroom aides would be. So that would be your general instructional aides, but your special education aides, which were a concern last year. Um, Can we say that one more time? So it, your uh, general aides, so just like your classroom aides, but your special education aides are, are in instructional support. We, uh, is that considered our paraprofessional as well? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the instructional support group, you're 6% above for employee pay, 6% for the, you know, the pay structure, which means that they're in a competitive structure. And then you can see that um, the starting rate is even with market. But there's been a lot of targeted efforts for our special education aides, and we continue to implement some of those to make sure that they are competitive and are being compensated well for the jobs that they're doing. Because we know that is a very sure. difficult position to fill and to keep. <clears throat> sure. Other questions? Perfect. All right, so we're going into our recommendations. So as always, we recommend that the proposed pay plans with adjustments are adopted for the next school year, strong starting salaries, all of the midpoints are aligned with market, and um, the jobs are aligned with structures. And so really just making sure that we're adjusting the pay grades to make them competitive, that we scoop everybody in, and that we're shifting everything to make sure that those salaries are strong, not only with current employees, but also to bring in employees when we need them. We recommend that we adopt a general pay increase to maintain market position. And so we did recommend two models in collaboration with um, administration. Model one would be 2.5% for teachers, 2% for other exempt pay groups, so that would be your administrative education, administrative business, and those other teachers that are on the administrative professional um, pay plan. And then 3% for non-exempt. And then model two would be 3% for teachers, 2.5% for the other exempt pay, and 3.5% for non-exempt. Those are the two models that we started with. We also recommended for teachers that we give some adjustments at years two through 15. And the reasoning behind that is we wanna make sure that the teachers that we have in the district that we're training and investing in within those years stay. And so we wanna make sure that their pay is competitive in the market. That's where you saw um, that those salaries were at 98 and 99%. That's where we gave those adjustments to make sure that we're bringing those salaries up to above market also. Plus that's your more veteran <coughs> teachers and we want to make sure that they are being compensated well. One of the initiatives of the district is to make sure that all teachers are compensated well, but especially those veteran teachers, so we are retaining them here in condo. Other adjustments that we provide to make sure that we have internal equity, that salaries are competitive across all pay groups, um, we bring to 1% above minimum. So anybody that would be, after we do adjustments, would be below minimum of the pay grade, we're going to give an additional 1% to bring them 1% within. Or for the administrative business and um, all but grade four in administrative education, we're gonna give 1% of midpoint for anyone whose pay is less than 90% of midpoint. Grade four in administrative education uh, is more of our related services and we actually give them um, a placement scale. So that way they get extra adjustments through that, as you can see in the next bullet. So grade four in AE, as well as administrative support and all auxiliary, except bus drivers receive um, a placement scale of 12 years to midpoint. And that is a celebration. We were able to reduce um, the placement scale from 12 years, I'm sorry, from 15 years to 12 years for that group, which so we're getting closer to midpoint, which is great. That's a huge celebration. And then for instructional support, which would be those aides that we were talking about, and police, 
this year we were able to get them at the midpoint at 10 years right there. And so that's another huge celebration. Again, going to your efforts to make sure that pay for these employees is strong um, through over the years. And then the other adjustment that we recommend is for <coughs> any employee that's in the educator career pathway that we ensure their pay is 2% above the daily rate of a teacher to ensure that that career pathway, so your counselors, APs, and our assistant principals, principals, um, are being paid more than a teacher, but they're also being um, supported in that pipeline for administration and those type of things. So we give them some teacher pay equity. And then we recommend that you continue to annually review district compensation plan and update as needed um, to maintain market competitiveness, competitiveness. And you've been doing that every year, and that's why you know you all are really strong and that we have strong salaries and that we get to bring <coughs> celebratory news tonight mm -hmm. all right and so here are our models so we gave you the recommended but here is the cost model and so i'll let you look at that as you can see the general pay increase there overall for all employees is 2.5 percent we recommend 0.4 percent in adjustments which would be an overall 2.9 percent for the model one And then model two, overall, it would be 3.1% for general pay increase for all employees, 0.4 in adjustments, and 3.5. And Darren, I know we're gonna get to this when you do your budget presentation, but when you show the budget presentation, you are you have built off of model two, model two correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Can you go back to model one? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Please? Yes. Thank you. I'd like to, okay, that's fine. I would prefer to see, oh, you got the adjustment by category up at the top, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Were those numbers based on current staffing or anticipated staffing for next year? Because I know we've been working for, like, building up the number of police officers. We voted that in, mm -hmm. gradually increasing staff. So what staffing levels were those numbers? So it's based on current data, and it is a snapshot in time. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. So I noticed in your charts where the police were below 98%, whatever they were. I don't, I don't remember what, exactly what the number was. But yet, when I see a general pay increase here, and of course there's fewer numbers, so the number's smaller, that doesn't concern me. But why, why is there, is it a, they're not an adjustment? Is that because in the police pay scale, there's not they're not out of whack, Basically. so it's just an increase for everybody. Mm -hmm. now, the yes. line is fine; it just right. goes up. Mm -hmm. And their internal equity is very strong right now. I'm sorry, I, I probably answered that. No, no, okay. but you're you're right. <laughs> and one of just part of the other conversation that we've had with police salaries, for example, talking to chief is, you know, there are the, the local departments that we compete with to hire police officers. Um, they give stipends or additional amounts depending upon the type of certification that a police officer may have and we don't currently do that we're, they're working chief and uh, Matt are working on a proposal now and to bring me information of what that would look like but that's part of the other issue here is that you know we've had an issue about how many years of service we give when, when folks come in that's one challenge that we're working through and then <coughs> that certification increased pay as well um so is it a while back we were gonna we talked about hiring 60 new police officers maybe it was up to uh, up, up to eight yeah up to 80 or mm -hmm. something like that i don't know in in that model chief or mm -hmm. no how, how many have we hired and how many do we have left to hire and does this pay increase which uh put us in the money for being able to hire them is that is that a good way are we in the money in other words if we can't hire any more at this level mm -hmm. then we need to revisit revisit that even though i, I understand 98 and 100 percent of market but that doesn't take into account like you said some of the other local situations right we currently have 11 officer positions vacant. 11 available 11, 11 vacant, yes. do you plan on filling we just hired two that will start April the 17th. 
we're looking at uh, there was part, uh, February 17th. We're looking at some more uh, in April. Uh, we're not getting quality applicants. Uh, we're losing some because of the certification pay and, and how also coming in. Uh, last pay, uh, pay raise, they left the starting salary the same, which I think some of the other departments raised their starting. So we've lost a little bit there in starting this past year. Uh, the, uh, the certification pay is big because a lot of the departments, outside departments as well as ISD, <coughs> are paying a certification pay for like uh, your intermediate, advanced, master level certification, uh, which uh, is when you put that on, then they're paying quite a little bit more. So was the expectation for you to bring something back to us? Yes, yeah, so there, Chief and Matt are working right now on a, on a survey of districts of, and local agencies as to what they're paying for each of those certifications, as well as looking at our current police staff and who has what certification. So if we, we would know if we did oh. implement that, what it would cost. So we'll, we'll have that information. Um, Chief's going to have it to me within a month. And then we'll, so before we get to a you know point where we're finalizing any of this, we'll have that information to bring for you, forward so, to you as well. So in, in, in simpleton terms, which is what I need, the last person that you missed that you wanted to hire and couldn't hire, was it over 2,000? Was it over 10,000 or somewhere in between or 20,000 or? We have lost some officers to other ISDs and outside law enforcement and they're making eight to 10,000 dollars. Eight to 10, okay. I can echo what Dr. Null said too. One of the things that sorry, Jennifer, <laughs> that we've been working with HR to refine is how experience is credited. Mm -hmm. So years ago, for a lot of jobs, you didn't have to give all kinds of experience credit because you could entice people to come work for the school district because you had great benefits and a great work environment and hours were great. That's not really the case anymore, right? So over time, we need to refine how that experience is credited. It's still a great place to work, but our benefits aren't as great as they used to be. and pay uh, is competitive in private sector too. So all that to say, uh, police is one of those areas too where we're refining how experience is credited. So even if the structure's fine, getting people further into that structure faster and granting more experience credit will help part of that problem and the, the dollar differences. And one more question, Chief. Is that is that eight to 10,000 for a seasoned officer or is it for somebody that you're gonna train? I mean. I mean, yeah, I know that would depend on what kind of certifications they had, but are we, or are, are we're talking about starting somebody, or are we talking about somebody with experience? I think where we lose is, is right now for, for an officer coming into the department with uh, 10 years would only get paid the same as a uh, two-year officer. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's one for five years. That, that's really, and that's been like that. I was able to get that 18 years ago. We've been using that model for about 18 years. So it hasn't been increased. So most of the departments are giving one year of experience for one year of staff. And that's been for probably the last five, 10 years. Thank you. That's another piece of the puzzle we're, we're working on to look at as well. It's, it's been a problem for eight, eight or 50 or mm -hmm. however many years. And, and the other part of, of having vacancies is uh, the applicant pool has dwindled. Not a whole lot of folks want to be police officers. And what we're seeing in the police academies are not totally qualified police officers. Uh, they go through the academy, but they're still not the best qualified person. Dr. Phillips, you can work on that. Mm -hmm. You got to get the elementary kids. Got to get them pumped up about this. <laughs> <laughs> Career day. Got to get them right. Career day. Bring in all those officers. <laughs> Absolutely. Are there any other questions on the presentation or the models this evening? I, I have a couple of questions, and it might might be a bit, a bit challenging. So I just I just need some some help. Um. So it, there was a. We are at 100% of first year teachers uh, compared to our peers. And then there's some kind of a gap for the next 15 years. So my question is, is maybe it's for Dr. Sharples or, or, or whomever, but for those 
employees that do leave that have the experience between years two and 15, why are they leaving? Are they leaving because of pay? Because this, this here shows that other districts have to increase pay to keep their teachers there, and we don't. I mean, we have a job fair that is standing room only, people trying to get in. I understand being competitive, but I'm not, sh I'm not convinced that pay, the salary increase, is, is as necessary as, as, you know, you say we want to be competitive in salary. I'm talking about total compensation and benefits. Help me understand better why we need to have such an, and I'm not talking about the police department because I think that was fairly clear, but the other areas, why, why is it necessary to, to put, I think it was 1.4 million in salary adjustments? Mm -hmm. And so when we're looking at adjustments, we're looking at individual pay. And so we want to make sure that not only is the group, so we're looking at groups here on average, right? That's what this is looking at. Oh, you said it was our peers. Correct. Our so peers. compared to our peers. And so we look at two different things. So externally, we're looking at on average how we're competing. But internally, we want to make sure that we're also aligning our pay appropriately for all of our employees. And I, I okay. understand, I appreciate okay. that, but my question is, is that as big a concern as it's being presented today? Is that, that gap, you know, that $500 a year gap, is it, what, what priority is that to, to, our, to our teachers? I mean, are we losing them over $500? Well, if, I, if I may speak yeah. to that just, just for a second. What, what happens though if you don't address it, is that gap will start widening? Yeah, exactly. Spoke for me. I was <laughs> <saying>. <laughs> that, that gap will get better. Like we did 16 years ago. The boxes that we had. Like we did 16 years ago. It was a lot of work once we got behind market yes. to yeah. get caught up. So the adjustments okay. that that they're showing yeah. are just to start. Cr they're not taking that that $1,322 and giving it all at one time. It's right. it's incremental <laughs> adjustments that over the next few years we're going to give slight increases to bring us back to market. It's not an all at once adjustment. It's just to keep us from that gap getting so big we can't make it up. And this gap only came about this year. If you remember in prior years, you've been really well aligned. It came about this year because of the House Bill 3 volatility. So some of your neighbors, if you remember House Bill 3 said that you had to give more for experienced teachers. So some districts gave a lot more. And so that, and that happened at year six and beyond. So that's why some of them put it down yeah. year five. So that's why that gap oh. occurred. Well, what, what Darren's talking about is when Dane was here, yeah. like 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and we had people that were starting out equal to five-year T. I'm, I'm using yeah. it as an yeah. example. Yeah. I don't remember what the numbers sure. were, but you had serious out of whack on the mm -hmm. 0 through 15 or 0 through 25 or whatever. And, I mean, you had people up here making the same thing as people starting. I mean, if I can be so... I mean, I'm not sure that yeah, was an exact difference. Right, yeah. But one year or two years experience making the same thing that seven years or whatever. And it was really <coughs> topsy-turvy. And But I think I also understand what you're saying. Let's say, let's say we got to keep it in line. But when I hear you say that we're, we're really doing well and so on and so forth, I mean, we're, most of us are business people. <coughs> and if I, I mean, I love teachers. I don't want this to come across wrong, but if I'm having to pay the same thing that all Dean is, something's wrong. Let me just be blunt, okay? Because I would rather work in Conroe if I was a teacher than in all Dean. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that I'm as worried about the 98 versus 100 as I am keeping in escape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You understand that there's a difference. And I'm with you, Jeff. Are you, are you, you understand, is yeah. it, did that's, I say it basically, No, I, I'm, I'm with that, and this is the, because this is a workshop. This is, this is the perfect mm -hmm. time to ask these and, questions. And that's teachers I'm deserve yeah. more, but we do have budgets. <coughs> that's, my, that's my point as well, is, is like you just said, I mean, people are oh, lined up to come work here. I don't need, I don't need to get reelected so I can speak the truth, okay? But I'm just well, I got three more years, so I'm gonna But I'm I'm telling you that that as a businessman, I don't want to be paying 102 percent of market. Okay, I want to be paying 98 and still have happy employees. So I mean, if there are if I if I can if I could just uh, um, let me speak a little bit on behalf of teachers and sure. all of our employees. Everybody's got an individual story. So to say why, you know, those teachers that are leaving from two years to 10 years, are they leaving because of $500 or 700? I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Some I'm sure are leaving because of life, whatever. Of course. But are some leaving because of, because of money? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And um, 
what we have to do is, is keep our eyes wide open too, because while we're looking at one piece of the large market here, we also have parts of our school district that don't have the luxury of just being able to pick from 50 teachers every time they have an opening. Right. Okay. We have parts of our school district that struggle to get teachers and they happen to also, but right up to a school district that pays significantly more than us. So, um, while we might be $1,300 behind the market, the reality is we might be $5,000 behind the school district that's two miles down the road from our schools that we have the biggest difficulty hiring teachers. And so we can't lose sight of that. I mean, it's fair we enough. can't have an attitude of, of living in the land of plenty because there are places that we, we do have that based on grade level or location or you know where the workforce lives mm -hmm. but we also serve a lot of a lot of students that their teachers don't have that and so yeah. we just can't lose sight of that I through the process point, but I, I also agree with from john and excuse us perspective we got to look at it from a more holistic perspective it's all about a happy balance I, I, yeah you got to have happy balance i mean we want to pay them as much as we possibly mm -hmm. can but at the same time we have an obligation to make sure we're being frugal and uh, being fiscally responsible. My issue becomes from an insurance and a benefits perspective. I think if you're comparing yourself to that neighboring district, I think that we're doing a, a, a much better job. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if we're having difficulty attracting teachers, is it a situation where we want to isolate that specific area or that specific school as opposed to everybody reaping the benefits of one, one smaller segment of the entire teacher population benefiting for, because of the outskirts of our district, but up to schools, districts that are paying significantly more, and we need to entice folks to, uh, for those schools specifically. Yeah, that, that's the question. Yeah, no, and I, I would agree with that if we were talking about paying our teachers 110% of market, we're talking about paying our teachers. The other thing I would remind you all here is we're the first people they're seeing this year. Well, I was gonna Meaning say. Meaning what, yeah. what we're showing is based on last year's salary to last year's market. Correct. Chances are we, we could do 3% or whatever this may be, and it might look like 101% of market today, but they're all gonna have these meetings over the next four months and they're gonna do a raise too, and then we'll be right back at 98% but, but, by the time the school year but starts. No, let, me, let, me, let me ask you a question. Is, are there any more requirements this year on salaries from Senate Bill 3, or was it a one-shot pony? It, it only comes with the increase in the yeah, basic allotment. Yeah. There so. was no increase this year in the basic allotment. Okay. So, so, so first of all, that's not in the mix this year. Right. 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 Second of all, as we well know, a lot of districts, you know how we reserve those those <laughs> excess mm -hmm. for for that shortfall next year. There's a lot of districts didn't have that luxury because when they were required to make those, they didn't have the money to start with, and, and they certainly don't have the money now to go back with just as big a raise. So, I mean, that's, I mean, let me be blunt. I am all for giving a, an increase, mm -hmm. okay? But I'm not sure I ever want to be north of that 100% mark. That's what mm -hmm. I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. okay? Just yeah. because we do, I mean, you know, I'm not sure that our teachers pay any less for benefits, but they probably have better benefits than the TRS district right down the road. I know that for a fact. So do you, okay? And, and and whether they pay fifty dollars or nothing, and they pay a hundred or nothing or whatever they pay, that kind of falls in the in, in the cracks for me. But I just I know uh, I understand what you're saying, but I, I I think that we have to be responsible and be pre. I mean, we we do a lot for our people, and I want them to continue to feel that. Way without us going overboard. If I could clarify too, because we don't show the entire teacher schedule on this because this is a sideways slide and that's really long, right? But the idea of those corrections from two to 15, all those teachers are not getting $1,300 adjustments. To Darren's point earlier, it's simply getting you closer to that number so that gap doesn't widen. So really it's chipping away at the difference, not negating it entirely. So like Dr. Knoll said, we are trying to get you as close to 100% of this year's market so that you don't fall further behind next year, but it would be unaffordable to give every one of those teachers a $1,300 increase plus 
3% on top of that. Well, let me so ask you something. What was Sorry to interrupt, but if you take this chart at mm -hmm. post, implementing either scenario one or two, do you have what that will look like? We can make it, sure. I mean, right now we just have the teacher structure that shows the adjustments by year, but absolutely, that's yep. easy to get. Before we go on, I want to say something about that, though. Like that five-year block and that 10-year block, <laughs> They, those don't just matter to the five-year teacher and the 10-year teacher. That matters to the first-year teacher and the second-year teacher. Sure. Two classmates coming out of the same class at A&M and one says, I want to go to Conroe and one says, I want to go to XYZ school district. Okay, we're going to start off the same, but five years down the road, they're going to be making more than I am. Ten years down the road, they're going to be making more than I am for doing the same job. So those blocks matter. To the less Absolutely. experienced people too when they're looking at what they could be doing in a long-term career mm -hmm. it's a pretty good analogy except you should have used sam houston stuff. <laughs> 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 okay uh they come out of mississippi state Who else can I uh, well, one more quick point because insurance is very important y'all i'm sure have read in the news about all of the trs active care volatility and now there are districts that are standing up alternatives there are many more that will stand up alternatives in the next few years uh, does, does everyone understand what I mean by that? They have active care now. They are through their district of innovation offering an alternative program. And so the two districts that have done that, three quarters of their insured people left active care and went to the alternative system, which was more affordable to those employees and to the district for that matter, with a better quality insurance according to the um, stuff that they've shared. So as, those, as your active care neighbors, uh, look at those options while you may be really strong right now. Just keep an eye out for that. Uh, now, That's assuming a, a legislative change may sure that uh, up, it may not be an issue, but just keep your ear to the ground because that may change. But someone was going to, you're going to ask the question. No, I, I think we're all saying the same thing. We want to pay the teachers as much as we possibly can, but same instance, we won't, we don't want to have them getting paid 110, 120% because it's next puts pressure on the next two districts to do the same thing. Then we get into this. Oh, mm -hmm. well, those are the conversations that we yeah. have that yes. uh, that thankfully Just sat through two and a half hours of. <laughs> yeah. We talk about those prioritizations. So bus drivers were a priority. If we spend money there, then we need to <coughs> perhaps spend less on teachers than we would have wanted to, and so on. So yeah, it is. You have a limited budget, so we're trying to prioritize how that all fits. And we have some priorities too, where it's difficult sometimes to find bilinguals and, and other specialties <laughs> and we're in a position where we have to pay up if we're going to fill those positions correct mm -hmm. and by the way i really love teachers yeah. uh, <laughs> oh no we totally understand right. we well, totally understand it's just the time to ask it, it is the time to ask this is the best time to do it absolutely i, I do realize that the percentages uh, that vary across the different groups and so on and so forth are partly sometimes because of uh, the size of of incomes in that in that category but I also have a little problem with saying that the elite very small for a district this size executive staff or administrative staff that works in this building only deserves two and a half percent I got a little problem with that okay it's not their fault that they're the winner that that they're the that they're the leader that they're the they're the superintendent and let me just tell you something. He's not worth two and a half percent. He's worth eight. I just can't pay him. Eight. Well, you know what? I'm right on your line too because I'm a former principal. I think he was going to say zero percent. down somewhere. Uh, but you know, I, it is true. But, but I, I'm just saying. Absolutely. So I'm a former principal, and so this the legislature even said it. We are not going to give raises to administrators, right? You can give it to everybody else. Well, that's them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't agree with everything they Correct. do. Correct. And so I would I, say. Absolutely. I'm for giving the same increase to the administrators that we give to teachers. And, you know, if you choose to be a teacher, if you choose to be an administrator, I, don't, I, I can't answer that, okay? We all make different things than what we do. You know, yeah. Darren makes a lot of money, and I don't, okay? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Pick on Darren. <laughs> we said 8% for him. No. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But mm -hmm. seriously, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know how y'all feel about it, but... I, I just, I don't think somebody's worth, right. I mean. Mm -hmm. And I so this is definitely I feel internal. the same way, John, especially when you start looking at job descriptions yeah. Yeah. and what yeah. others outside the district, yeah. the, the amount of assistance that they have to help them with their job descriptions it's, compared it's to what, wonder, these, it's wonderful. what they it's do every, as well. Every teacher and principal is in this 
in, in this district, none of them answer their phone 24 hours a day. Correct. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. No, and okay. we would agree with you with that. Um, you know, we go on the budget that breakout basically that we're given from the district, and so we can always propose other models depending on initiatives and what the board wants to do. So this is I, yeah, not really written in stone. I really wasn't saying that to you as much yeah. as I was. Well, but I will tell you as a former administrator, it absolutely, I would agree 100%. It burns my biscuits when they're always like, administrators get nothing, you know, or those type of things. Well, so. well they, 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 are, they are well paid, but... Yeah. They deserve it, too. Absolutely. especially, and I mean, not, I just, not just campus professionals, uh, <laughs> campus administrators. I'm talking about the group it's in this, your in central this office. office. That, mm -hmm. they, they have, for the longest time, been a very, 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 uh, like I said, uh, lean group. Okay? They get a lot done with the people they got here, and they deserve what they make. And I don't want to hold it back. I'm, I'm going on record with that. <laughs> Well, I'm not running. I'm, I'm, I'm getting off the school board. I might apply for one of the jobs. <laughs> now we need to work on retention. Hey, Big make sure y'all call. <laughs> y'all hire anybody. Call references. Okay. Chief, do I get to carry a gun? Yeah. <laughs> one bullet in my pocket. Mm. Twenty-five. <laughs> so these right now are 198, 99, 100, 100%. If you gave the 3% pay increase that Darren will uh, share later, it would be, again, assuming your peers are gonna do two or 3%, it would be uh, 199, 99, 99, 99. That's assuming all of your peers gave a 3%. On average, it moved that much. Mm -hmm. so that's our crystal ball. We don't know, again, you're the that, first That's on which scenario. Method that, one or method two? The, 3%. the number two. two. Model two. So model two was higher than 3%. It was 3% for teachers. Three and a half for non exempt. Yeah. 3.1. I was looking at three and a half over at the bottom there, but I see what you're saying general mm -hmm. pay increase. Just, yeah, just yeah. speaking to teachers. Mm -hmm. So really, it would get you 2% closer with those the district, y'all. I mean, come on. But now, that, but model two, you're not giving any of that. I don't want to throw a monkey wrench in there, but you know, the CPI inflation is 2.1 to like 2.6 next year, this year anyway. Yeah. Anything under two and a half, they're actually losing money. Just no, we agree, I agree with that. I, mm -hmm. um, Skeeter and I just did the discussion. Two and a half. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 3%. And yeah, we'll need to see what insurance premiums do and all that kind of stuff because we don't want to lose money there. Yeah, and that's a, that, you know, okay. I don't, that's something not that Darren would, could talk about, but that's right, Darren a, got it. Darren it's got looking it. like that's an area that we're going to have to really look at as insurance premiums. Um, Picking up more to call? Well, he just said based he was on pay for it personally. If it the, goes up, yeah. he just picks it up. They, our our uh, rate of claims right now is pretty high, so our... Our experience is very high. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Any other it. questions or discussion tonight? Thank you. I think you guys did an outstanding Thank job. Good. Thank you all. <laughs> good, good conversation. Awesome. Thank we you. We appreciate you very much. Sure. So, um, Darren, we'll transition now to Darren to talk about the budget. And, and as mentioned, if you if there's something that you'd like to see, if you wanted to see a 2.75 or 3% or across the board or 3 .5, whatever it is, you'll let us know. Um, TASB is great about getting us information that we can share it back to you all. You've got all the tribunal here. It's like the impeachment area. I got a glass. the board. I'm going to say three across the board, maybe three and a half. I can support that. Or something like that. At least we did that last year. I'm not sure. We did that last year. Yeah, I think so. I would, I would also like to, to add on the models that they were showing in Model 1, it included a straight 75 cent increase for bus drivers per hour. And in Model 2, it had a $1 uh, increase for bus drivers. And that's a 3.8% that's a increase on the 75 cents and a 5% and a increase uh, on the $1 for the bus drivers. So can you go? Like can you go? Can you tell me again what the what the percentages were for the different teachers on, on one and two? Yeah, on, I just I lost yeah, track one, of the numbers. Yeah, we'll switch it back here. Hang on. Yeah. Is it two point three and two point eight or something? On on model one, it was two and a half percent for teachers. She's pulling it back up here. Is she? And you can click through the last line. You can click through. Okay. 
two percent for other exempt groups and three uh -huh. percent for yeah. non-exempt groups. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then in model two. Model two, it was three percent for teachers, two and a half other, you and three and a half percent yeah. for non-exempt okay. groups. That's the one I'd like you to see to that three bumped three. up to three. Yeah. Three on the two and a half. Um. <clears throat> when you say okay, two point, I'm sorry. And model two, three. Okay, three percent for teachers, two and a half for other exempt. That's going to be your administrative business and administrative education. Which one, other exempt? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, what's yes. non-exempt? Non-exempt is your administrative support and your instructional support. Hourly. Okay, that's para your, your, your hourly. hourly. Your hourly. Yeah. I got you, paraprofessionals. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm good now. Thank you. We good with this? Yes. 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 Okay. Thank you. And we can email this. I can email you this no. as well, so you'll have it. You can see it. All right, Mr. Rice. All right, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Knoll. It is my pleasure to present the 2020-2021 preliminary budget. Our, bud our budget objectives uh, include to meet the needs for the 2021 school year. Um, we're in anticipating this year 1,400 new students. We're opening Stockton Junior High School. 12th grade at Grand Oaks High School. Mm. And we have also identified additional <coughs> allocation needs at the elementary and intermediate levels. As we just uh, had the conversation with TASB, we want to provide a competitive compensation plan. And we want to provide funding to meet the requirements of House Bill 3 that includes full day pre-K, reading practices, that'll be our reading academies you'll hear about for the summertime, uh, our dyslexia and CCMR programs, just to name a few. Can I just ask a question? Yes, sir. You're anticipating an increase of 1,400 students. Yes, sir. Does that include new pre-K? No. No, that no. is not that is not including pre-K. Well, why shouldn't it? Well, we, we have pre-K was already budgeted in the budget last year, the application that we have for that, so it's already included in our in our beginning. All budget. day? All day pre-K, yes, sir. Okay. That funding was provided to us last year, uh, in the current year, uh -huh. from, from the state, so that, that is in there. Okay. Because right. this, this year you'll see we're, we're buying all the supplies, the furniture, and, and, those, and those things preparing for pre-K with the funds this well, year. Yeah, I'm Next more, year will be I'm more concerned about the number of teachers. <coughs> yes, that is, that, 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 that is allocated already in the budget. We have that. We have that. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not sure I understand that, but go ahead. So if I, if I could. So the, in this year's budget, when we built it this time last year, we weren't sure if we were going to go to full-day pre-K this year or not. So we... we put $5 million into the budget last year that would cover the cost of those teachers. Because we did not go to full day pre-K this year, we were using that money to buy the furniture, playgrounds, uh, instructional materials that are needed. But because that that five million was in this year's budget, it's automatically in next year's budget. So it's not a growth item. I got item. that part. I got that part. I just yeah. was wondering why it was in this year's budget. Right. Thank you. I got it. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I thought you were asking. We have an increase in pre-K kids that are not part of that 1500 as well, right? Well, yes, but they're budgeted. I, yes. I got I budget I'm, I'm good. Uh, good. Uh, as far as that's concerned, I'm, I'm. Hey, taking a look at our, at our general fund balance, uh, this chart just represents 12 years uh, of our general fund balance. We ended 2019 at roughly $140 million. Uh, this past year, the board transferred $32 million out of the general fund, uh, fund balance. 12 million of that was to provide funding for technology in support of the 2019 bond referendum, and 20 million of that was uh, to establish the capital maintenance fund. So now looking at our fund balance analysis, our objective is to maintain an unassigned fund balance of 20 to 25 percent of our annual budget. That will give us approximately three months worth of expenses. Our unassigned fund balance at 831.19 was 134.7 million dollars. And that is 24.5% of the budget, which is $24.8 million over our low end target. However, it is $2.7 million under our high end target. Our strong fund balance position provides options for the board to use cash to fund one time payments for any project or program needs that y'all see that arises. So some flexibility there. <clears throat> This is our 2019-2020 Houston area tax rate comparison. You can see the red column there, that's Conroe ISD. Our tax rate is currently at $1.23. We're still the second lowest in the greater Houston area. 
Uh, the darker shaded uh, columns are our, our area of Montgomery County school districts. And the green are our peer districts that we compare to both academically and financially. And if we take into account only our peer districts, um, our tax rate of $1.23 is 15 cents below our peer average tax rate, and we're four cents below the closest district to us in tax rate, uh, which is Fort Bend. I will say that this is now uh, the most critical chart that we'll look at moving forward with House Bill 3 is our attendance data. Um, our state revenue estimates and campus expenditure budget allocations rely on enrollment data. With House Bill 3, they have basically taken any growth of tax uh, revenue away from school districts. Right. So dollar for dollar in the same year, those funds will be taken away in the state revenue uh, calculation. So for the upcoming 2021 school year, uh, we're using 1,400 students. Um, that will bring our uh, enrollment to 66,198, and we're using 94.2% uh, for our <coughs> ADA calculation. Um, last year, as we, yes. But I gotta stop and ask again, I don't care what you budgeted for, if you have 800 more pre-K students come in than this 1,400, I don't understand, where are they? If they're not in the 1400 before, they're, they're coming. If you open the doors, they're coming, right? Mm -hmm. we, we already count them in our calculations. They're just going to be with us all day long, but they've already counted previously. Curtis, you've been telling me, I understand that they're going to be there, you know, twice as long, okay? Mm -hmm. And that takes different, di that's different kind of expense and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But because of the law change, they, there's more coming. Aren't there? As well, the criterion to enter pre-K didn't change. I understand right. that, but there are some. There is a potential of, of a half a day yes. that yeah. they wouldn't participate. We will not Correct. receive additional funding. We only receive half of an FTE. Even those those students will now be in school all day long. We will only receive revenue based on half a day. Okay, and so but if you have, you pick the number five hundred more. Okay, and you receive a half a day for them. Have you got them accounted in that 66198? I say no. You've got 1,400 kids you're expecting new, mm -hmm. just like we've always expected mm -hmm. that many new. And if you get, because it's all day, allows more parents to participate, yeah. and you have 500 more kids, I don't care if they count a half a day, they, then there ought to be 250 added to that number if there's 500 more. And we did, but normally we would budget like 1250 for Am a I missing year. something? We, we 1350. 1350, yes. we had we, 50. And, but it's a great point. We may be light on that because we don't know, we anticipate that well, we were 3K like is going to go we were light because we don't know. We don't know what the actual. We don't know. Be. But we it's reasonable to expect. But you're not projecting more. in that. Four, we have 1400 growth without any pre-K change. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'm saying you're going to have some pre-K add. And if you don't count for them here, then the budget's not true. We already have all kinds of, uh, I mean, numbers that, I mean, you know, it's like the five million that we didn't use. I mean, y'all may be spending it on furniture and, it, and all five million might've gone out the door, but somehow every year that 140 or 134 seven ends up being 138 or 142 or whatever. And I'm telling you that number's gonna be higher than that with pre-K, full day pre-K. And I don't know if it's accounted for and I'm missing something or or we're missing something. I don't know which. If it's me, I'll shut up and just listen. Okay. How many total pre-K kids do we have right now? Today we have 1,538. So if you could figure 10% more at another 150 students. Well, that'd be 75. That, that's not yeah. any big number. Yeah. But I mean, do you really expect it to just be 10% more? That's, what we're, that's been our experience at our two full day. With our two with yes. our two pilots, that's kind of what we're basing it on. Mm -hmm. Aren't we already over sixty five thousand though, and we're estimating sixty four seven ninety eight as of well, August thirty one of twenty twelve. Well, that that is as of snapshot. That is as of the snapshot date in October. So that is not but, that is not current. But that where, is traditionally what the number. But his is. point is, where are we today? Six sixty four nine sixteen today. Sixty four nine sixteen. We're almost sixty five. Almost sixty five. Almost 65. Mm -hmm. See, if, if I was projected for 2021 and I was almost at 65, I'd add the 1,400 to the 65. I mean, that's me. That's the way I would do it. And then we've got the real true dollars to look at. And I mean, I'm not trying to put fluff in the budget. If it isn't going to be there, tell me, Darren. I mean, 
I know you're always conservative. That's what you get paid to do. So that I have more dollars at the end of the year than, than you said we would. I got that, but I think these numbers are way low. I think you're gonna have more than that. And I, y'all know more about it than I do, but I can't help but believe there are gonna be plenty of parents that couldn't leave their kid because it was a half a day that bring them in because of full day and more than they already have. And that's because it's geographically restricted right now. I, I just think there's gonna be more. But anyway, let's move on. And, and, and going back to, to 1920, you know, like we said, we used 1,350 for a projection. Well, we actually realized 1,961 increase, over 600 uh, additional students this year. So as we move through this budget, you will see where we will be at. We will uh, forewarn you about a budget amendment that we, we will be bringing to the board because those 600 students, we had to hire teachers right. uh, to teach those. So we will be coming with a budget amendment uh, in this year to cover those. Right. But, but but on the other side of that, you made the eighty <coughs> the, the water to, to pay for. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. I will say for the record that we do like having more numbers because we can hire on the front end. Yeah, so yeah we just always, always go on record on that. Yeah. And, yeah. It just makes us nervous that well, if we don't meet, you know, if you if you over budget, this is this is where school districts <laughs> get upside down in their budget. If you if you overestimate and then they don't show up, now you are mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. and, and you're you're running a deficit budget. That's the that's the concern. So we tricky part. We'd love to be dead on, but if we're wrong, we prefer to be on the conservative side and be just below. But I mean, yeah, certainly, and, and it, I've never had a problem with that before. Right. Just just with this pre-K thing, all yeah. pre-K. I think it's going to be a bigger number than that. Anyway, let's, let's don't be the dead on budget in that. Okay, our certified <coughs> property values. Uh, we're estimating property value growth at five and a half percent. Uh, that will increase for the year $2.1 billion, bringing our, bringing our total certified value to $40.2 billion. And with the changes in House Bill 3, the impact on funding is actually minimal for the general fund. Um, but this is the primary source of revenue on a debt service fund, so this increase will help us maintain uh, that debt service tax rate at the 26 cents. <clears throat> So with the implementation of House Bill 3, any increase in tax revenue is offset with an equal decrease in state funding for the general fund. And we, I know y'all remember we used to talk about the one-year lag where we were able to realize some of that, some of that increase, um, but now it is dollar for dollar in the year that that increase occurs. So we will actually realize no increase um, from tax revenue. The other thing that the state is doing with House Bill 3 is they're compressing our tax rate continually. Last, <clears throat> last year, you remember, they compressed it seven cents from a dollar down to uh, 93 cents, but here is further compression uh, of our tax rate uh, for the amount of growth of our local property. <coughs> they're limiting us to 2.5% uh, growth in our, in, our, in our tax revenue. So for Conroe ISD, assuming that we have 5.5% value growth, MCR stands for maximum compressed rate, you take our current compressed rate, which is 93 cents, and I would like to qualify this by saying that this does not include the golden pennies that we're able to access uh, in tier two of the state funding formula. So uh, 93 cents times uh, the limiting factor of 1.025 divided by our anticipated value growth of 1.055, our new compressed tax rate will decrease from 93 cents uh, to 90.35 cents. But that's prior, like he's mentioned, that's prior to that golden penny that is, is built into, you know, bringing that extra funding for pre-K, dyslexia, all those different pieces. Um, so we'll we'll see the true uh, impact from that golden penny on the next yeah. slides here. And so, and so the, yes, sir. Aaron, real real quick. <clears throat> so the the two and a half percent increase is on budget year over year. Is yes. that right? Mm -hmm. So even if we're opening, even if a district opens up five new schools. And they have to increase. <laughs> Doesn't matter. The it only, the only additional revenue that we'll be generating is from our actual ADA. Daily attendance. attendance. Okay. Yeah. That, that is why our, our, our peer reporting and, and everything like that is going to be very important. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah. So here's our proposed tax rate. <clears throat> now, this is taking into a, a f account the golden pennies that are available to the district. On the MO side, our tax rate will decrease uh, from 97 cents. To 95.35 cents. You can see that's a decrease of 1.65 pennies. Um, 
debt service will remain the same uh, for a total tax rate of $1.2135. And that's on the assumption of five and a half percent growth. If, if we were to get seven percent growth, that would it would go down. Yes. Yes. And and one thing I would like to point out what is different this year is <clears throat> the state of Texas is actually gonna calculate our tax rate for us this year. When we get the information from the appraisal district, we will then go onto the system and we will input all of our values into the system. It will go to TEA, they will come up with a calculation of our maximum compressed rate. I mean we have a we feel we understand and we can calculate that, but they're gonna do it for us. If that comes back and we don't agree with what their calculation is, we will have the ability of, to appeal, but they will be setting that m and tax rate for us uh, this year. Which is not a lot different than what the county lady has always said, like this year, we had to. On our debt service side. Correct, correct, correct. It, I mean, it's, it's just a matter of who's setting it, right? Correct. So now looking at our pro forma 2020-2021 uh, budget, uh, beginning revenue side, uh, $555.62 million. Um, local revenue based off of 5.5% AV growth in a compressed tax rate of 95.35 cents. That'll generate $13.83 million. I'm going to say net state funding increase with 1,400 uh, students will be 8.76 million. If we didn't have the the, the one year uh, decrease because of property value growth, that number would be close to 23 million dollars. Cool. So so that is you see that decrease that they have um, uh, with the property values there. Our TRS in kind that's just our annual reporting number is three and a half <coughs> million dollars. We need to add to that uh, this year. Um, total revenue increase $26.09 million for our total revenue of $581.71 million. Uh, beginning expenditures, this is amended because we are going to request a $2.75 million amendment uh, for those additional teachers. That's $552.33 million. Uh, salary increase, uh, $12 million. That's right in line with Model 2 that you saw from TASB. We're also in, including a substitute pay increase of $5 per day for our substitutes. Uh, that's a cost of $300,000. Mm -hmm. um, and now just our uh, additional personnel for growth for the year with our 1,400 new students. Um, we have a place marker in there for uh, $12 million. We're working, uh, we'll be working with Dr. Hines and, and, and his staff as those uh, enrollment numbers come in and we distribute them out to the campuses how those uh, uh, teacher allocations will work through our formulas. Um, and then the other uh, identified areas that we discussed earlier at the intermediate and elementary levels, um, we don't exactly know what that's gonna look like yet. We're working with Dr. Hines, Dr. Phillips, and Dr. Winkler on that program to see what it's gonna look like. Um, so we kind of left that blank at this time. Um, the employee retention stipend, right now we're backing it out because the funding for those new allocations for the elementary and intermediate will come from that money. However, if there is funding left available, we will come back with a recommendation for, for, for some type of employee retention stipend. So if I can just jump in there, yeah. that line that has the question marks, um, that's based on, just on work that, that we've done and talking to our principals, also looking at data, um, our campus climate and culture, our OHI data as well as student academic performance data. Uh, our intermediates at this point are, are um, uh, they have the lowest staff ratio, or I guess the highest <coughs> student to staff ratio of all of our levels. And, and they are an area where we've identified we are struggling academically there and with climate and culture. So we need to make some adjustments. So the question right now is, do we adjust the the, the basic staffing formula from, is it 26, 26 students? You know, do we need to adjust that down to 25 and a half or 24, whatever it may be? Or do we need to look at some specialized positions that we have in our secondary campuses that we don't currently have in our intermediate campuses? An example of that would be like a student support teacher, someone that comes in and can help with uh, testing and 504. So that's, that's what the team is working on right now. There's, there's basically $5 million here as a, as a placeholder. If we were able to achieve those functions and 
feel like we're staffing those campuses appropriately and do that for two million, that would leave three million available for a potential employee retention stipend if y'all chose to use it that way. But we don't know yet for sure how much we'll need to spend. That's we were working with the principals to get a feel for what their needs are, uh, as well as what we feel like we can achieve, um, specifically on the intermediate level. Some on our elementary level too. Elementaries where we have only one assistant principal and one counselor, they are um, very challenged as well. They, they, we might need to work with them in addition to the intermediates to give them some type of relief. Um, so that's, that's for that five million. So once again, if there's any left, then it could come back as a potential employee <coughs> retention stipend. And Dr. Noel, on average, what are we running as far as populations in our elementary schools? Size-wise? Mm -hmm. I don't know if so that's an average. It varies depending. I know on it does. Yeah. Uh, we have some that are. Right? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, the, the flex school, the flex school models are a thousand, thousand plus right? that. Right. It's kind of by generation of school. Right. You I know, understand. Of, so the uh, fl current flex school model is about a thousand. Yes. <laughs> I mean, they're the, the answer to the question is big. So one I mean, principal, one AP and one counselor for a thousand kids. Well, well they, they get an, they get an additional AP based on number. Right. Um, but what we have learned is even if you're at a smaller elementary, you may be in an elementary school with 800 mm -hmm. and you may have one AP and one counselor. Mm -hmm. But if you have some specialized programs right. um, that that require either a lot of meeting time. Sure. That could be like 504 or, or um, yeah. bilingual ESL, mm -hmm. uh, or you might have specialized programs that the students just require a lot of attention on a daily basis. Right. You might have both of those folks that get tied up all day long uh, in dealing with situations and that leaves the rest of the campus without the support that they need. So those, right. those are the <coughs> challenges that we're trying to balance. It's not simple enough to, we've always um, done it purely by numbers, you know, if your enrollment gets to 851, then you get a second AP. Right. I, I don't think it's that simple anymore. Right. We, we really need to, so we need multipliers for programs and sure. special needs, and that's what we're trying to work on. So what's the model at uh, Derrickson or uh, Stewart, where they have K through six? So we typically would give them two assistant principals because of that. One there, there's, depends on the size of the campus. Do they all have two, or they, though Stewart has one. Two now. Yeah, but assistant it's, principal it's, wise, we, we've, we've always given them two because they have seven, seven years worth of curriculum. So as instructional right. leaders, you need somebody that can break that up. Shushma was, mm -hmm. I think Shush, Shushma was um, when it opened this year, I think it was scheduled to have like 650 students and didn't it open at like 740. It opened very like large, that? but <laughs> Shushma yeah. is that what? Yeah, they're. They've grown from day one. Ever since we opened, they've been growing. They're sitting at uh, 914. Excuse me, 914. Yeah. We, we, had them, we had them at 780 before the year started. Yeah, seven, I knew I'll come my numbers wrong, but I knew there was a, I knew there was a big difference. And then you have to account for that as well. It's like, okay, well, now we got 200 more kids. What do we, yeah. what do, right. we do with this? Yeah. This is a question for you. Go ahead. So I see additional personnel for growth. Is that including opening Stockton? Is that, is that which? is including opening. Okay. Yes, sir. I was making one of which so line that Stock, was. Stockton's kind of a replacement. Right. I, I know. I know it's not going to be a full ground up brand right. new but, staff. But, but that includes any custodial bus routes. Librarian. All, librarian. You know all the all the staples. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So other expenses: one point five million dollars. That that is to cover any. Uh, uh, utility increases, of course, with opening a new campus, uh, fuel cost increases, et cetera, items like that. Uh, then you see the offset on the TRS in kind, uh, the offset of the three and a half million dollars. So total estimated expenditure increase, uh, you know, we still have to find out about those uh, adjustments, $24.3 million. And you can see that that leaves us with some potential funds to address those concerns with uh, $5.08 million. Does that include uh, putting any additional money uh, for the um, maintenance the, uh, maintenance fund as well, or keeping it? Our budget has a built-in $10 million per $10 year. $10 million. Right. Yes, thank you. Uh, so kind of what's next for the budget process? We, you know, we need to finalize our revenue. We're early in the process. Um, finalizing our state funding, our local assessed value, we'll be getting, a, you know, 
appraised values will start coming in in the next few weeks and then they'll be certified uh, the 25th of uh, July. Um, the tax impression calculation will be working with TEA when we get, the, they're actually going to take the information early in April. Um, so they're going to have to do some estimates on their, on their side to come up with a, with a number. So uh, we will actually be providing that information to them in April, which is kind of early. Um, then finalizing our expenditures with our additional personnel, as y'all heard, we're working on that. Uh, the TASB compensa compensation recommendations, uh, then our individual campus and department expenditure needs other than uh, personnel. And then you can see all the meetings uh, with, the, with the board and the district level planning and decision making committee that we have coming up. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Any further questions for Darren? Can we spend any of the initial money that we put in the fund? Capital maintenance fund? Uh, we've bought. Uh, some land and some buses. Oh, yeah. right. That was that first $10 million that we identified to purchase mm -hmm. land and buses. Um, what we take a five minute recess? All right, well, we will go ahead and pick it back up. And as we <coughs> discussed, this, this is kind of a hodgepodge of information that we're going to give you here. And, and a lot of it is just simply information. But if, if there is uh, feedback needed or guidance needed, we'll make sure to make that clear. Uh, as we get going, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Hines, and I'm going to pass out some handouts down the way here as well. Thank you, uh, President Williams, members of the board, Dr. Noll. Uh, just again, as Dr. Noll just shared, we have uh, several topics that we're going to kind of move through this evening. They're all they're all really information items. There's a couple items we'll definitely want to get some some feedback on when we when we mention. Uh, class ranking we talk a little bit about the uh, additional the school year calendar um, and but generally wanted to give you an update and kind of uh, I also want to I want to preface the what we'll talk about in that we're still learning a lot so we're going to give you very broad information because a lot of this is still being refined and defined by the state as we go and so um, we don't want to get too too deep into the details because those details are changing and we don't want to uh, Come back and try to un, unlearn some things. So uh, we're going to hit with an overview of the effective schools framework because you've heard us talk about that a little bit. It drives a lot of our improvement process and our planning. Um, and that's just kind of an overview just to help you understand when we make reference to some of these things where we're coming from. Um, we also will touch base just a couple of the highlights from the assessment, some changes in the House Bill 3906. Very, uh, a lot of several changes. Most are just, just for your information. We'll highlight a little bit from House Bill 3, which has to do with the new requirement that, that the board adopt goals and plans um, that particularly are relating to early childhood reading and math, as well as our college career military readiness indicator. So there's specific language in the law that we have to develop specific plans. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, we already do district improvement plans every year. And we do. We do have plans and we do have targets, uh, but certainly it's really about ensuring that there's a focus on these areas and so it's actually specifically named in the law um, and then we'll touch base a little bit about class ranking and some of the things that are happening around us and just to get you up to date um, and then we'll talk about a new law that passed that has to do with additional days school year uh, again just some information and then finally we'll, we'll we'll end it really on a topic that was alluded to during the compensation discussion when there is a um, a new thing out there called the teacher incentive allotment and so we'll, we'll cover some of the highlights of that and it has to do with the state wants a program that identifies uh, high performing teachers and rewards performance uh, and it weights uh, a, an allotment of money that are that, that can be earned and awarded to a teacher and it and it weights it based on the uh, demographic um, location of the school so if it's in a rural area, they get more money. If it's in high poverty areas, they get more money. So it's kind of a way to do. And we'll, we'll share a little bit of information about that. Again, that's not something we know a lot about. We're just starting that process, but we wanted to at least make you aware that we are beginning this, this journey of learning about it and trying to develop a plan to bring to you at some point in the future. And that's really what a lot of this is tonight, is just kind of to introduce some things that you will hear more about in the future so that when we do bring these forward, you will have some background. Um, but again, we're, we're developing a lot. I'm going to turn it over. Um, beginning tonight will be uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, who will talk a little bit about the first two items on here. Good 
Good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Noll. I want to first start out with an, a brief overview of the Effective Schools Framework, or the ESF, which you've probably heard of that acronym. Basically what this is, this is the state's model for school improvement. This is the vision that the state has put together to strive for excellence for Texas students. And this model captures best practices and strategies that are proven. It is a proven model that was piloted in several districts throughout the state. The purpose of the model is highlighted on the one page document that you have in front of you. And there's actually three components that you will see. The first component is the common language, which, which is the best practices of effective schools that have been tried and true throughout the state. There is a continuous improvement model, which includes a diagnostic. And there is also an alignment of state resources through this model. We actually used a part of this model at Sam Houston Elementary last year. So as, as you know, that there, there were some su success stories from this model. This model has five levers as a part of the model, which include strong school leadership, effective, well-supported teachers, a positive school culture, high quality curriculum, and effective instruction. And each one of these models includes district commitments that we commit, commit to as a district to make sure these schools are successful. This is important for school board members to know because this is the driving force for school improvement that we will be using throughout the state and throughout our campuses. A part of this model also will be used to help readjust some of the goals that you will hear about tonight, including a comprehensive systemic training for our leadership development program. And the whole point of this model is to increase student outcomes. So that's just a brief description of that model. So Dr. Taylor, so this, this will be the foundation of our new school improvement yes. team and department. This is really what the foundation will be built on? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And does the state, much like the STAR or, or other mechanisms, are they going to have some kind of grading? I mean, are you going to be superior and average, or are you going to be below the mark, or, you know, what are, are they going to have some kind of accountability tied to this? Or is this just a, you know, great idea? What they idea? currently do is a diagnostic for campuses that are identified as a campus in need of improvement. And that's what Sam Houston Elementary went through last year. Right. And that diagnostic will point out like your top three or five areas to work on. So it's the, the traditional accountability system will still drive the accountability. So we get our, we have many systems that we're under. We, we're, we, we talk about the most common when we shared the taper, but there's other things like the data validation system. There's one that's called, uh, that's RDA results driven, driven, driven accountability, accountability where the state puts us in statistical, uh, more or less evaluations and, and gives us a ranking. Um, and so this doesn't replace anything. It's just an additional. It's just an additional framework to help support campuses. <laughs> this is the framework that we use to, to hold us accountable. We don't get <laughs> yeah. a grade don't on it, that part but the state will say these are some best practices that I would like for you to implement. But if your schools are struggling, then you have to implement this. But it's good for all schools. And to be proactive, these are some of the components, as Dr. Noel mentioned, <clears throat> that will be the foundation for our school improvement moving forward. I can't see why anybody would be against this kind of mission and goals. It makes sense. I think uh, strong leadership has to be there. You've got to have supported teachers. You've got to have a strong culture. And I know that sometimes can be issues. Uh, and then effective instruction. It goes right back down to the teacher in the classroom, making sure that they're doing their job each and every day and that they're supported properly. Right? Am I missing? Okay. Yes, definitely. Well, I like the goals and everything. It's just that, you know, it's like when the federal government tries to hold us accountable and the state government holds us accountable, and pretty soon we're going down so many roads to accomplish so many different things that it's not just five, you know, right. yeah. common sense things, yeah. like you say. Yeah. Who would be against these? Right. It's just that where one of these falls short, the other one takes off and we got to go a whole nother level or something else, you know, uh, improvement or whatever it is that, uh, you know, to accomplish that thing, and pretty soon we're trying to answer to, to 15 different bosses or whatever. So think of this as the structure that helps us develop the answer to all those different right. things. Exactly. And that's what that's the what foundation. The, yeah. That's In right. a perfect world. That'd be great. Yeah. 
That's who we are, John. No, oh, that's what we're in. Okay. So our next item deals with House Bill 3906, and this bill is about assessment and administration. House Bill 3906 is one of the largest bills passed that dealt with assessment. And some of the highlights of this bill include uh, multiple parts of the assessment giving over multiple days. And what the state is saying that this might happen throughout the year as opposed to having a star test at the end of the school year, it will be fragmented throughout several checkpoints during the year. Another item is standalone assessments in fourth and seventh grade writing will be eliminated in the year 2021-2022. Currently, our fourth and seventh grade students take the STAR writing test. The federal government wants writing in all grades. So what the plan is, is to assess writing in grades three through eight, just as we currently do for students who take the EOC exam. And this plan is set to be implemented by the year 2021-22. By the year 2023, the state is saying that only 75% of the assessment will be multiple choice and the other 25% might be a short answer, fill in the blank. They're still working out the details, but we are aware that there will be some changes in the world of assessment. The biggest change that I wanted to call your attention to is electronic assessments. The state is required to put a timeline together to transition from paper star to full electronic assessments by the year 2022-23. And we have already been working with some of the things that uh, the state is, is requesting will be, and we will continue to be mindful of this time frame that so that our kids are ready to compete when we get to this level of electronic assessment. Are we assuming that they're improving their method of electronic assessment and it won't crash in the assuming, middle of the test? Yes, we okay. are assuming that. Thank you. We've had that a few times. And I, and I would much less <laughs> all the tests in Texas. <laughs> Not to be too cynical, but <laughs> Dr. Taylor, where don't have the best track record. Where are we infrastructurally? Um, are are we ready for this, or what steps are we taking between now and then to make sure we have the, the broadband capacity and the hardware of just the proper computers? Our technology department every year does a, a full overview of the infrastructure before we start online testing. We've not had any problems with our internal systems. We do know that, that as we grow and get more schools that actually test online, that will be a, a different story. We'll see if that, if that really works for all of our campuses. The only issues that we've had in previous years were based on the state. It was based on Pearson and the inability to fully load the electronic assessments. Do, does the testing system currently run on an iPad or does it have to be run on a laptop? They just added iPads this past year before it was laptops and that, that gave limitations to a lot of campuses. <coughs> so now they are adding more uh, ability to test on different devices so that campuses throughout the entire state can follow this model. We are testing some additional devices to try to get, you know, we're interested in putting out uh, currently the bulk of our um, Laptops are Chrome, Chromebooks, which are not touchscreens. So we're looking at two questions. One, you know, for a better testing device, a bigger screen and a touchscreen, which adds significant to the cost. So, you know, it's certainly something we're looking at. But we're starting to pilot some new devices just to see if it's a better testing machine. So we're getting, getting some feedback. Any additional questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Thanks, Dr. Taylor. Taylor. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You. Taylor. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Upshaw, and we're going to kind of move uh, from assessment into what I mentioned earlier about the board adopted goals and plans that were in House Bill 3. Mr. Riley, members of the board, Dr. Knoll, this portion of our board workshop, we're going to address the House Bill 3 requirements to uh, discuss board adopted goals and plans. And this requirement looks into us, like Dr. Hans had mentioned earlier, to identify goals in early childhood reading and math and also in our CCMR plans. So when you look at this portion, how is this aligned to those five levers in the Effective Schools Framework? This really looks at us highly focusing on lever number four, which is high quality curriculum, and lever number five, effective instruction. So it really asks us that what we're doing curriculum-wise is really meeting those needs in these type of assessments. 
So the School Finance Commission recommended that each public district or ch uh, charter public school network establish these goals and that we report them annually to the public. So why does this matter? So in keeping in alignment with the state 60 by 30 Texas goal, the School Finance Commission recommended establishing a pre-K through 12th grade goal with at least 60% proficiency at the TA ETEA meets. Remember, there's three levels of passing rate. It's the approaches, the meets level, and then the masters. Standard at two checkpoints along the state's public pre-K through 12th grade educational continuum. And they want to make sure that we're meeting these goals by 2030. So the two key points are that 60% of all students meet the state's meet standard at third grade reading. So why is this goal third grade reading? So this goal really is about, you know, we really want to make sure that we're closing the reading gap at third grade. A long time ago, you know, right now we have SSI in fifth grade. In other words, we want to make sure that our students in fifth grade pass reading and math. They get many multiple opportunities to pass that test. We used to have that in third. We want to make sure that kids are on grade level in third and have the math skills that they need in third grade. So this goal is all about what's happening prior to that to third grade and make sure that those strong systems are in place. And also that 60% of all high school seniors are graduating with the needs, without the needs for mediation and achieving. Um, they're achieving an industry accepted certification alignment with a living wage job, they're enrolling in post-secondary education, and they're also enrolling in military. And this is the CCMR <coughs> component. You know, we've been talking about this with you as a school board uh, several times this school year already. We came in October and presented to you the accountability report, which this component um, is reported in Domain 1 and Domain 3, and also uh, Mr. Colshin came later on in November and talked about SAT, SAT performance, advanced placement, and dual credit. All of those things come together to meet this goal. So let's look specifically at those plans. So in early childhood literacy and math, the annual goals for aggregated student growth are on the third grade math and reading assessment, so that would be on STAR. These annual goals are also asking us to look at each subgroup. So we might do well in third grade reading and third grade math, but this is asking us not only to look at the overall, but to really hyper-focus on our student groups. So those student groups include economically disadvantaged, Hispanic, African American, Pacific Islander, American Indian, white. Um, we can also look at, if you look at the last bullet there, we can choose as a school board to add additional goals for our bilingual and ESL populations. This is that population that we have talked about every time we come to accountability, that this group of students takes about five years to acquire that language and we still want to make sure we're closing that gap. In this specific plan requirement, it's also asking us to target specific professional development for classroom teachers in grades kinder through third in reading to make sure that our teachers have those skills that they need. And it also allows us as a board to identify if there's campuses that are not meeting specific plans or they're not meeting these goals that we can consider to add additional staff development to them so that we're meeting those unique needs of those uh, bilingual education or special language programs. On the CCMR side of this goal, these annual, oh, did I turn that off? I apologize for that. <laughs> these annual goals um, are for aggregating student growth on this readiness indicators like we mentioned before, and that were evaluated under the student achievement domain. These goals, not only is it about, like for example, if the state says that the goal is a 70, excuse me, a 60, we actually are a 71 this past year. So we grew from last year to this year six points in this goal. But that's an overall goal. Once again, it's asking us to look at does each subgroup perform in that specific area and how are we meeting those needs as our uh, population changes in Conroe ISD. I have a question. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna assess at third grade, mm -hmm. okay? And before, fifth grade was the last year you could take the test in Spanish, is that correct? Um, Sixth yes. grade, you yes, can no longer take it, right? Or, yes, sir. Or above, mm -hmm. right? So are they going to change that, or, or do you just have to pass the, the literacy and math in your native language, in your language, in whichever language? So fifth grade continues to be the last year that they're uh, available to have that in their native language. So third, yes, to answer your question, yes. So they can pass the third in grade Spanish. in Spanish? Yes, yes, they can, sir. And that would mm -hmm. be proficient. Okay. And when we do the checkpoints along the way, 
it's assuming we would do it in their language that we're instructing in. So if they're getting it in Spanish and we think they're going to pass it in Spanish, we'll test them in Spanish. And then if we think they're going to pass it in English, we start moving it over. Absolutely. Does this change our, we talked about it before, our, our, our push to get them into English? So I'm glad that you asked that. One of the good thing, good things about our school district and these plan components as you're developing these goals for third grade reading and math is that we currently have good systems in place prior to that. So maybe not so much in other school districts, I'm not really sure, but in our school district, we monitor English performance and Spanish performance in reading all the way from pre-K prior to third grade. So now what we do is when we're doing that, we're assessing them in both languages and having the discussions, what are they strongest in? Because our model, and we have changed this recently, it was an early English language, <coughs> English language acquisition model, so it was about taking kiddos, you know, and learning English, and we were meeting about 67% of our population. But there's that rest of that population that it's not about just meeting the English, it's the kiddos that have to have that support of the both native languages they move through the program. So if a child's not ready, we're gonna offer it in their native language. Because truly the bilingual program is to build bilingual, biliterate, bicultural students. So it, it doesn't really, it shouldn't matter in where you give the test because if you ask me a question, I can answer to you both in English and Spanish. So that's, I can't. yeah. <laughs> so our, it's not only about, so they get to this level, middle of the year, second grade reading level, let's move to English. It really is about, we assess it all the way through. And even if they pass the test, you know, in Spanish or in English, we still continue to assist them in that native language in both in the older grade levels, because we can continue to support that program. That okay. makes sense. Before it used to be, they pass it in English and they're out. Now it's about keep them in the program to help them keep that language. Because the research tells us that a child that performs and passes well in English in third grade might not perform two or three years down the line as well. So we've had to adjust that a little bit in our, in our model okay. to meet the other 33% of this population. Dr. Shaw, um, the previous slide, you were talking about yes. some goals. And one of, on, the, on the bottom says, um, that, well, not that one, but you had said that the, the board may set additional goals. Is that what you, is that what you said? What, 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 would it, what additional goal would, this, would the board set, or would that be something that you would come to the board for support or approval to add an additional goal? So these are done in collaboration. We would come and we would recommend data and we would recommend goals to be able to be implemented, and then you would have the ultimate vote. Okay. So the bottom line of this whole thing is three goals. One for math in third grade, one for literacy in third grade, and one for CCMR. That doesn't mean that we can't choose to make goals in second grade, in first grade, in kinder, that we make as a school board. But you only really need to have three. But in order to get to good reading and math scores in third grade, it's not just about the third grade star. It's prior to that. It's looking at those things prior to that. So we internally have those systems in place. And that's, we plan to come later on this spring semester to show you what that data looks like mm -hmm. and to suggest some recommendations of some goals that we can implement and be able to possibly set up a progress monitoring calendar where we show you how we were progressing through these areas throughout the year. Thank you. We've kind of already built in the progress monitoring for CCMR. You, you got that yes. in uh, November. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're trying to work some of those structures into existing structures as we move forward but but it will be a process of uh, what we anticipate is later in the spring we'll bring you a, some recommended goals to consider um, we won't have to decide at that point and then maybe come back a month after that to get your formal approval after we get feedback from you I like that. so this is more of a preventive model for this developing goals versus a reactive model right that's why you're looking at all day pre-kindergarten and looking at staff development specifically focusing on teachers being able to build capacity of students early on and one other yes. quick question one of the uh, <coughs> ways you can attend all day pre-k is is english as a second language yes right? being yes. identified Correct. yes People sir that, that's mm -hmm. when you want to actually encourage right that's yes sir because it gives you extra year mm -hmm. yes sir okay. to help with that letter id and language absolutely so the next piece like we talked about 
a third possible goal or one that we would implement would be one for the CCMR. So the HB3 offers the opportunity for us as a school district to receive outcome bonuses for student, uh, students demonstrating college career and military, military readiness in all those areas that we've discussed before. And the goals for CCMR should reflect multiple opportunities for students to demonstrate uh, the CCMR and keep in mind the requirement for HB3 outcome bonuses require students to continue in post-secondary and the military. So other specific plan requirements, we talked about earlier that there's targeted professional development for classroom teachers and earlier Mr. Rice talked to you about that there's reading academies and that we budgeted for uh, what that looks like in our budget for next year. So what we have right now, what knowledge we know, and you have a one pager in front of you of what these reading academies would look like, is that every teacher K through third grade and reading intervention teachers, which are the people that give our dyslexia services, instructional coaches, and our campus administrators would go through a reading academy to be able to build, build these skills. What are those things that we want to see in kinder and first and second so that our third grade scores do increase? And um, when you look at this piece of the reading academy on the bottom part of the flyer, that's the comprehensive <coughs> curriculum that they are proposing. We are still, um, like Dr. Hines said, developing this as we go. So the one thing that we've been very proactive as a school district, since we will be serv serving or being able to staff development over 1,500 teachers, that's just with our estimations right now, that's not counting anywhere from three to 400 additional teachers a year that we might hire. Um, we have gone ahead and we have applied to the state to be our own authorized provider. That means just in the same way we have our own ability to T-test train our administrators, we've done the same thing, we've been accepted to do that. And we will be going later on in March to figure out what this curriculum looks like. <coughs> There's two models. There's the comprehensive model and the blended model. So one model is a face-to-face -face model, another is an um, online module model. And we still need to find out a little bit more on which way we're going to choose to do that. We are receiving some additional allocations within the elementary literacy department to be able to have leaders that lead the staff development and that coaching that would help teachers and staff to get to that next level. Dr. Upshaw, mm -hmm. if I can ask maybe your, your opinion on this, how much of the content of these reading academies is actually new and based on current research and current best practices and how much of this is somebody digging out the reading academy curriculum from the 80s and dusting it off and putting it online? So we are still trying to learn that curriculum. We just received from the state a one-page table of what the outline looks like. So we don't quite know yet. We will say this. One of the pieces that's much needed is authentic phonemic awareness, Amen. intense phonemic awareness instruction in our classroom, a dedicated 15 to 20 minutes a day to be able to build that skill with our kiddos. It helps and so read. how do you do that? Spell. And how do you as a first grade teacher help that struggling reader? And as we grow as an economically disadvantaged school district and that percentage grows, that need to understand how to do that in your classroom becomes more and more. And so we need to help our teachers problem solve that at the table with the kids in the moment. So some of that good stuff is still good stuff, right? And, and, and how much how much freedom are we going to have to custom tailor this stuff for our for our district and integrate this with Lucy Calkins and, and things like that? So the units of reading and writing is one portion of our balanced literacy model. It's about 15 to 20 minutes of the whole 110 minute literacy block in the elementary grades. But the good thing is that's why we became an authorized provider. So that we have the ability to talk to teachers about now this is what it is in our curriculum. If not, we'd be relying on somebody else that doesn't know what we believe and doesn't know what we use, like what phonemic awareness items we have in our district to be able to address that, words their way or so on and so forth. So that is why we've gone ahead and, and uh, been a part of this. And we're a loud voice in the school district, uh, in the state of Texas when it comes to this. So we wanna be a part of that pilot year for the whole state as we learn <coughs> to uh, influence how this looks like for the future years. Because the goal is not only K through three, eventually the state is saying all the way through junior high. Okay, thank so, you for asking that. So if, uh, if you're training in person, you know, at a staff development center, okay, what time of day is that 
typically occur? Mm -hmm. I can answer that because I can't find a parking space around my office where that happens. But <laughs> we're so saying, sorry. <laughs> I'm saying, what I'm saying is, what you know, you're taking the teachers, whatever group you take, you're taking them out of the classroom <clears throat> during that day, or you're keeping them after hours. I don't know which or both. Uh, I see them there all times day and night, frankly. So the piece that we're very attracted to about this is that it comes with a reading facilitator. So it's not necessarily about, there, shall, there will be some face-to-face -face training, probably in the summer. But there's a piece to this that's job embedded. So with this reading facilitator that helps 60 teachers that we're getting additional personnel to do that, it's about coaching within your planning period and coming during that 45, 50 minutes and saying, bring me your most problem readers in this time around, bring me your C's, and then we can coach teachers how to do that. That's what, that's what teachers really want. So it's not, it's just not sit and get. It can't be sit and get because it won't change practice. And that's not what we believe in our school district as staff development. But once again, we're still trying to figure this out. <laughs> and we still have to figure out what it is uh, with the curriculum that we're going to be teaching. But, um, and I'm sure we'll be able to get feedback from our teachers and principals on how we could implement this. Thank you. And the last piece of this is just developing those goals. As we look through this, like we had mentioned before, it's about three goals that at minimum that we can set. And they're specific goals, they're quantifiable, and they're measurable goals. So we'll talk to you about what those baselines are. We'll talk to you about what possible population our student groups are made of and how they're performing. Uh, we'll set annual targets. Um, and our goal is to grow that within a five-year mark, obviously looking at that on a year-to-year -year basis. And then being able to, um, for us to adopt those outcoming goals and progress measures so that it creates alignment with all our plans. Not only this plan, but all our plans. So this should be part of the bigger plan, like Dr. Hines had said. It doesn't sit in isolation. It, it helps grow the overall performance of all our students in our school district. Do we have any questions? It's a lot of information. <laughs> Thank you. There it is. Thank you very much. And, and again, I think the impact on that, 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 that third grade goal is really, as Dr. Upshaw shared, it's about putting the focus there makes you step back and say, okay, what did we do before that, mm -hmm. right? And really putting that emphasis on that K-1-2. Uh, so it's really, really important uh, information. Um, next, we're going to change gears, and Mr. Colson is going to share a little bit of information about class ranking. And, um, and this is one of those areas where we did want to get a little bit of feedback to see if there's interest in, in us doing something with this or not. Um, but certainly, uh, we did want to share some information. I'm going to turn it over. Okay. Yeah, probably in recent months, you may have seen coverage in the media about districts changing their policy as far as ranking students. Mm -hmm. Um, board policy EIC uh, is the <coughs> policy that provides for automatic admission for students graduating in the top 10% of the graduating class to any Texas public institution, with the exception of the University of Texas, which is allowed to reduce that rate, and they currently take the top 6% of those graduating students. Um, in addition, it requires that these students graduate under the foundation plan, foundations with endorsements, and can also meet college entrance scores on SAT or ACT. Um, it's re the policy requires that districts notify students once during their junior year, once during their senior year, of their class rank. It requires it's done in writing. Now, we use the Naviance system, and students log in, and they can get their GPA and class rank at that time. Um, what we do currently is that we rank more often than the law require than the board policy requires. Uh, at the end of a student's freshman year, we'll take all the grades earned, uh, wait till through summer school to make sure students have a chance to include any grades, make up work, and we will issue uh, rank at the beginning of their sophomore year within the first couple of weeks of school sophomore year. We repeat that after their sophomore year. Then at the seventh semester of their junior year, uh, we issue a rank, and we issue it again at the end of their junior year. Uh, the, the rank at the end of their junior year is the one that they will use to qualify for automatic admission to any of the state schools. So the application process takes place either during the summer or early fall of the student's senior year. Uh, we rank more often than we need to. And then finally, at the end of the third nine weeks of the senior year, rank is finalized, 
and that's what's used for <coughs> undergraduate, magna cum laude, summa cum laude, and those recognitions, at, and valedictorian and salutatorian at that time. Um, you know, a lot of districts ha have looked at the po process of maybe uh, making it less number driven uh, so that a student is not simply a number. Uh, there is more to our students than that class rank indicates. And also an, an opportunity to, po to potentially reduce stress and anxiety on kids. Uh, I, I can tell you that students know what their rank is and they also know what, what their friend's rank is, and they also calculate what they need to keep it there. Um, I can remember freshman parents coming in, and their goal is they want their child to graduate in the top 10%, and everybody does, which automatically means 90% of them are gonna be disappointed at some point in time. Um, so we're trying to, to put the emphasis on achievement rather than rank. Um, these are seven school districts in Texas that have uh, adopted a different policy. Uh, they no longer issue rank uh, except for the top 10%, which is required by the policy and by the law. Um, they will issue, some of them will rank the, the top 10% and issue it at times given by the policy at the end of their junior year and midway through their senior year. Um, some of them will issue the GPA that is the lowest in the top 10%, and then they will issue the students their grade point average. And if you wanna know where you fall, you go check that bottom rank. If my GPA is a 4.2 and the lowest GPA in the top 10% is 4.15, I know I'm in the top 10%. Beyond that, it doesn't matter what you rank in the top 10%, it just matters that you're in the top 10%. Now UT is a little bit different and then they have to get to that 6% level. Um, they also issue quartile ranks um, in where you fall in, in the quarters. Um, and again, in, in talking with the, the Houston area directors of guidance and counseling, uh, they feel like a lot of the districts are making this move to try to reduce stress and anxiety on students and, and concentrate more on not where you rank but what you've learned. Uh, we were concerned. We, we uh, looked at 22 different policies from our, our uh, comparison districts, and these were the only seven of the 22 that had adjusted their policies. There are some in the Houston areas who are considering making that move. Uh, concerned about what the impact would be potentially on admissions standards for our students if we didn't rank. Uh, Lord Willard, our specialist in college and career, sent out requests to multiple universities. We got responses from 15 of them who assured us that that class rank is not a huge indicator outside of Texas and Texas A&M in admissions. Uh, they continue to emphasize holistic admissions process and not only are they considering the student's GPA and test scores, but also the experiences that they've had in high school. When we send transcripts out to universities, we send a campus profile with it. And in that profile, it describes the community that the school's in, the academic programs available to students, um, that the, whether there's an academy at the school, a list of colleges and universities that the previous class attended. It kind of paints a picture of the opportunities that students at each high school have because our high schools are different. Uh, while they all offer similar programs, they each have their own identity. Uh, those are very helpful in our students uh, gaining admission to colleges and universities. Some of the private schools indicated that uh, when they took rank out of the equation, that it, was, it really helped a lot of students who may have been, if you were considering top 10%, that, that 15 to 20% range of students, and it made them look at them holistically and consider more than grades and take a look at life experiences. The college essay becomes very important in the admissions process. Uh, so they assured us they didn't feel like that not ranking students would be a hindrance to our students being accepted into universities. Um, across the district, uh, most of our campuses get more than the top 10% into A&M and more than the top 6% in UT, but that's because of the relation, the, the, reputation our district has for producing quality students. And I think that will continue regardless whether we, we continue to rank or decide not to rank. So really the question we have tonight is not 
do you want to change this policy? The question we have tonight is, would you like us to explore this as an option? And what that would look like would be Mr. Colson leading a, a committee of our high school administrators, some parents, different people involved to, to study this further and then bring a recommendation to you in the future. But we didn't want to do all of that work if it's not something that you have an interest in considering. I don't see anything that can reduce stress on kids. Yeah, I would too. I think we take it too far sometimes with some of the kids and their competitiveness and trying to make a certain, you know, ranking. I mean, it gets, it gets, it gets beyond out of control. It's a learned behavior. And it is. Yeah. So, so I, I take it, I was kind of taking a different approach. I would like to know what you, you, you ask us what we would like, but I would like to know what you think because, um, is this another everybody gets a trophy? Let's take, let's take, you know, valedictorian out of the picture, you know, kind of thing. Or is this really necessary? And I'm not disagreeing no, with y'all. I'm asking. I'm no, not telling. I, from my I'm understanding, just, I, I, let, me, let me try to regurgitate what I've heard here. I think what you're doing is not telling everybody where they stand. Correct. So you're not one, two, three, or you're not number 365. In, so it's not like GPAs you know, aren't still there. It's just not you're not telling folks I'm 365 and and I'm three you know 30 and my friend here is 100 number 100 in the group. Um, that's irrelevant for purposes of if you can accept it to the top 10 percent. You're just saying if you're in the top percent 10 percent, we're going to give you what the bottom potentially one of the scenarios. Right. What that bottom number is, and you know what your GPA is, then you don't have to worry about folks trying to compare themselves versus. And, and competitiveness in them trying to overstress to get a certain um, class rank, if you will, right? Yes. Okay. So, oh. so, so I, 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 I hear what you're saying. We're not essentially saying we're doing. I'm not really doing. saying it. I was asking it. Okay. okay let me. I, I really, truly respect mm -hmm. your all's opinion. And and, and Mr. Coulson, you've been there. You've seen. I mean, recently, you've seen the stress. I mean, these other administrators have been in the puzzle palace so long they forgot. But you've been there. Recently, and I'm just, I'm just picking on them. I'm old but, enough that I have forgotten. But but, but seriously, I, I would I would like to know I would like to know what you know is is this a, is this an important thing? Is this uh is this reducing, I mean, the uh, achievement or is it improving the? I mean, uh, what is it going to do? Yeah, at this point, without really involving a lot of other people and getting a lot of other input from other quarters uh, quarters of the district. In, in other districts, it, it's really hard to predict. Um, you know, I can tell from, from my, my previous experience that those kids who put pressure on themselves to be in the top 10% are going to put pressure on themselves to be whatever it is, regardless of whether we whether we issue a rank or, or the bottom uh, GPA in that in that top. They want to be the best, top, whether top. whether you're ranking them or not. They know what classes their competition are in. They know what grades their competition are making in those classes. And that's just the way they're built. I mean, the ones my experience and their parents are built the same way. I mean, that's their parents send their kids to school with the expectation to get a good education. And um, those kids do. That's so um, without the short answer is we'd have to study it more to really know what kind of an impact it has and reach out to some of these other districts and say, what changes have you seen as a result of change in policy? And, but your question is fair. I mean, I think and when you so when you read, and I think you answered it. I yeah. think we'd like to see it mm -hmm. because we don't know, yeah. and then make the decision. So I, my my question is this: um, when a student who is outside that top ten percent, when they go to apply for, uh, you know, for college, um, this the the school. Does, they're not looking at class ranking outside the top ten. You're saying the top ten and top six, they're automatic admission, but the rest of them, they're going to apply. Right. So the class ranking doesn't matter at that point to that school, to, to that university, correct? They're look, they're, there's other, that part is taken out, and it's GPA and SAT, and then... It, it's still there right now. Yeah. It's just, it's, I, I it's considered, right, but, but it's not an automatic deal. For example, if they applied to Stephen F. Austin and told them they were in the top 20 top quartile instead of the top 10 percent that would be what they would report plus a like you said the essay or the right. whatever else goes along with it what else did you accomplish and did you go to school and you know uh, right a lot of the stress comes from students who, who may not be in the top 10 percent who are 
desire to go to A&M or UT and they don't get early action admissions. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to wait until those two schools or and, and other schools consider the automatic admissions to know what kind of space they have to admit those students. And that, that's why we continue to get more than our 10% and our 6% into those, but it may not be during the time frame those kids wish it was, which adds another whole other level of stress. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm, I'm with John and everybody else. I'd, I'd love to see what it what it looks like as well, because I've, I've heard rumors of how these, these things right. work, and I, you know, I don't, how do I say this? I, I hope it's not a slippery slope for other things. Well, you know, mm -hmm. now we're taking class ranking away, and now are we going to do something else to just keep coddling the kids? Because competition is good. I mean, everybody in this room is successful because you were competitive at some level. And so, but I do understand the stresses that the the burden that these kids have, and, and unfortunately, it's 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 real. So I I'd, I'd be interested as well. I have a question. Do you think the stress is more now than it used to be? I do. Yeah, I do. And and is that brought on by the family? Is it brought on by? Uh, I mean, you know, we well, all wanted in the ten, you know, top ten percent when I graduated yes. too. Yeah, but maybe it wasn't. I'm, I'm asking why has it changed? Why is it a, a more of a stressful thing? How much time you got, John? <laughs> okay. Well, I, 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 I see this as, I mean, personally from my, my household, when you give them a rank, it like puts a number on their head, I'm this number, this number. If you, I, I make it an, an analogy of a relay race. Why are you looking back or in front of you? Just run as fast as you can. And when we get to the end, we'll see where you are. Right. You know? um, that's my analogy. I don't want my kid stressing out looking behind him at his buddy because that slows them down. I didn't want to get overstressed trying to compete with somebody who's in number one. Stay in your lane, run as fast as you can. At the end of the day, we'll see what place you come in. And, and I think that that's a fair assessment. When you when you look at these districts that have done it, you look at the the um, the community feedback. You'll hear all the same things we just heard. People saying, "Oh, you you know, you're calling them. You're not you're not making them work or whatever." I think in the end, it's a realization and what these districts have decided is what I do should be looked at for what I do. It really doesn't have, what you do really shouldn't have anything to do with what I did. And that's, that's the difference when you take away the rank. It's my GPA and my grades are mine and look at me for what I did. And what the, the other kid did really is irrelevant. And who I happen to go to school with is irrelevant. What did I do with my opportunity? Um, and the reason, I mean, there, you know, one of the reasons we want to look at this, or all the reasons Greg said, but these are very high-performing school districts, right. you know, that have the highest, you know, you're looking at Westlake High School and Friendswood High School and the Katy School. These are, like, you know, considered to be some of the most uh, academically rigorous high schools in the state, and they've gone through the process. So we wouldn't have brought it forward if we didn't think the process was worthy, truthfully. And, and then in the end, we may decide not to do it, but uh, I think it is worth studying yeah, I agree. mr colson does this mean we would do away with having a valedictorian in the slew? Yeah, no. yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay that's that. good we still see who's going to win the race my point yeah. was <laughs> i got you, <laughs> the I got you. It doesn't matter. it's just a matter of identifying those two the and then the top it doesn't matter who's number 498 versus 499 anymore that's the, you know and part of it also is trying to dig down to that question about over time you know it is our policy getting in the way of students getting a look at right that's one thing that we want is to our make. policy right. getting in the way of what I'm getting sorry. a getting in the way of a student getting a full look at a college in other words so if, if the easy thing for them to do is look and they're saying if other districts are doing this and they're seeing that students are getting looked at more holistically because there wasn't a rank on theirs mm -hmm. is that is that somehow disadvantaging our students and I think that's one of the things that is one of those questions to be answered is it or isn't I don't know the answer, but I think that's part of studying this a little bit more. Is, is there something to that, or is there no difference what, whatsoever? You know, does it, does it impact academic performance? We don't really, those things need to be looked at and studied so we can bring you back maybe some more information. I think we're all saying it's, it's worth that. Yep. Yeah, this is Mr. Colson. Just, just out of curiosity, but um, for, for kids who, who um, the class ranking, they may be in this, the second half, you know, the bottom half. Mm -hmm. Do you see them when they find that out that they kind of give up a little bit saying, well, I'm so far behind, it doesn't really matter? Do you think that it weighs into it at all? You know, I haven't seen that. Um, okay. Just curious. Generally, 
that's what that's what those it's. kids are not as concerned about class rank I got gotcha. you it doesn't really matter up to that point mm -hmm. so whether I'm in the 45th percentile or 55th percentile doesn't matter got gotcha. you that was me no <laughs> I wasn't sure if I had a class rank in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I did. Yeah. It was, it was two people much. in your class. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna keep keep moving. We have two more items we're gonna try to go through pretty quickly for you. Uh, one of them is just to, to to give you a heads up. This is not anything that we need any feedback on, really. But we wanted to share, uh, unless unless you're thinking something different than we're thinking. So we want to share what we're thinking. Um, on the additional day school year, which is something new that was also a part of House Bill 3, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Phillips. All right, thank you. So um, I'm here to brief you on the component of House Bill 3 that addresses the option of additional days for elementary schools. House Bill 3 adds half-day formula funding for school systems that want to add up to 30 additional instructional days beyond the typical 180-day school year. And this can uh, be applied to any elementary school or grades pre-K through fifth. So the state is providing three paths forward that we could consider if we want to try to go for this. Option one is optional summer learning. And this would be maintaining a traditional 180-day calendar like we have now and then adding up to 30 days for additional student enrichment or support during the summer. This is very much like our current summer school model. Um, the advantage is, unlike our summer school now, the district could receive half-day ADA funding for this, so something to consider. Option two would be designing a year-round calendar, spacing the 180 days over the full year with intermittent breaks between sessions for targeted remediation with a subset of students. The year-round calendar would dedicate time solely for supporting struggling students and also minimize the summer slide risk that all students experience. Finally, option three is a full year redesign. This option encourages districts to completely reimagine the traditional calendar as we know it. Districts could provide up to a 210 day calendar for all students rather than the 180 day calendar, but they would use the time differently. Districts could choose to reduce the amount of academic instruction time for students and instead provide students with more recess time, uh, more brain breaks, extra PE, extra fine arts. For example, right now the core content teachers are now with students approximately in elementary school six hours a day. Option three would allow schools to reduce the time with their content teacher to five hours a day, allowing teachers more planning time to collaborate while providing students more recess and enrichment opportunities. And then, of course, students would be making up this content time by attending more days in the year. So those are just three options. And, um, you know, that we want to put out there, this, the, the participating is also completely optional. We don't have to choose one to move forward, but we're just putting it out there to get feedback. And, and, and right now, option one, Mm -hmm. It fits best with our model, and yeah. that's certainly the one that we're pursuing. But yeah. unless we hear something different, yeah. that's the one. If y'all think y'all got some emails over, I do have a question about that. When I was a student in Conroe ISD years ago, <laughs> Many. they had a limited campus version of option two where certain campuses were year round and that only lasted for a short period of time before it was deemed not a viable option. Nope, it's horrible. Why was that deemed not a viable option? <laughs> I wasn't campuses? here for that, but I know other districts experimented with that. And the main problem that other districts had is that with UIL and high schools, I don't know if that's what happened D here. Dr. Sharples, the, you, Dr. You, uh, <laughs> I didn't want to call her out. Oh man. <laughs> but, you need to, story and it was a very expensive endeavor yeah. that started with two doctoral students doing their dissertations on year-round school. We ran a school within a school at several campus locations. So we had a principal, one principal of the school, running a year-round calendar with set number of classrooms and then that same principal running the traditional calendar and it was, it, it appeared to be very, um, uh, the parents that had children with ADHD that they wanted their kids 
uh, going, you know, having breaks during the school year and all, but it was very confusing, very expensive, and phased out many years ago. Mostly, I, I was in high school when they did it, and it was only on elementary <coughs> campuses. Yeah. Yeah. Because of UIL, it, a lot of districts had a hard time doing it. So then when the kids, parents don't want their kids in two different calendars, and it just never just, really took off. I was just curious if there was any performance research between them. In other states, not, I, I'm not aware of any in Texas. So are we comfortable? We're assuming option one is our route. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Hines. I just and I'll mention too. You know, this has come up. It came up a little bit with our calendar process. Um, and there, these are examples of two districts that are near us that have some different looking calendars, uh, where they have what, like a week off in October and a week off in February, in addition to those other days off that we have. Uh, and I, I will certainly. Um, and they accomplish these by doing a lot more minutes, which has certainly other implications to it. Uh, I, I will tell you that I think, you know, given all the feedback that we've had, we have been very, uh, you know, given all the feedback, I think generally people like our calendars. They like our, our schedules, the way we, we run. You know, you've seen the feedback over time. Um, you know, but, but having a lot of, and, and these are also examples of what an intermittent calendar could look like in theory where you you build in days off for the bulk of the students during the year but you have students who are maybe needing additional help report on certain days um, I will say from planning logistics everything auxiliary the way we run other departments transportation all those things I would I would simply say we we, we like our calendars we like what we have in place but if, if you do have interest in us looking at some of these kinds of creative calendaring for next school year as we start that process in the late summer early fall with our district level i'm, I'm more than happy to to include that but these these calendars don't accommodate parents well either i mean folks have to work and you guys child cares i mean yeah. come on man this is this is well too much I, I, we, we we thought that we just wanted to make sure we showed that to <laughs> we agree but we had honestly. some people ask us from the district level part of what we shared with them is that you know We've been very traditional in our, we, as Dr. Hines always puts it, we think school days are, are good. We think it's important to go to school. Uh, yeah, after a while, you're going to be playing in school half the day, and then the other half, you're going to do a little work, and you go on school year-round. Yeah. Just, just hit it. Get to school. Get in. Get out. Perfect. All right. We're going to change gears, and then the last, really, topic tonight um, is the teacher incentive allotment. And this actually piggybacks a little bit off of um, some comments that were made earlier about you know targeted compensation and this is a program that is uh, the state is created um, but each district has to develop their own plan and it has to be approved at the state level and as well as by Texas Tech University and so uh, it's it's something that's just coming out again we don't know a lot yet we're learning a lot we're gonna have to we're gonna have to spend a lot of time roll up our sleeves and get into it but we did want to share that this is something that's coming and something we're looking at, and I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Green. All right, good evening, President Williams, members of the board, and Dr. Null. So another provision of House Bill 3 is the teacher incentive allotment. And our district is just now starting the beginning stages to try to plan what this might look like for us. So with this, um, the teacher incentive allotment is dedicated to recruiting supporting and retaining retaining highly effective teachers in all schools and what this um, part looks at is putting a high focus on campuses that have high needs and also rural schools so the goals that um, this incentive puts in place is they are to attract and keep effective teachers provide incentives to teach in challenging schools and then to increase the equitable equitable distribution of those effective teachers so as a district we have to de um, create what's called a local designation system where we um, put classifications to our high performing teachers and those classifications are recognized exemplary and master teachers districts will receive anywhere from three thousand to thirty two thousand dollars per year and that's for every teacher that's been um, designated within our district those dollar amounts will vary 
is depending upon um, the designation that the teacher receives, if they're working in a rural school, and the level of socioeconomic needs at that school. And of course, greater funding will be provided um, for designated teachers who are at those high need schools or the rural schools. 90% of the teacher incentive allotment must be used for teacher compensation on the campus where the designated teacher works. And what um, we have to do is put our plan together, provide it to TEA and both um, Texas Tech University, and they have to <coughs> approve whatever plan we create. So as Dr. Um, Hines has said, we are very much in the beginning stages of this and trying to determine what that might look like for us at this level. At least 90% of the teacher incentive allotment must be used on teacher compensation on the campus where the designated teacher works. Where else will it be used? Well, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm well, <laughs> so there's two, there's two teachers, parts. Yeah, there's two parts. One is they're, they're recognizing that there's probably going to be administrative cost to managing this whole program, so they're going to allow 10% to, okay. to, go, to go to that. And the other thing they're opening the door to... So you get your cut out of it. it, it <laughs> and we will probably have to hire someone to manage this program, but, but there's, there's also this reality of they're leaving some, some room to imagine plans where that money may or may not all go to the teacher. It could be spread out in other incentives to recognize other staff members on that campus. The, the part that's going to be interesting is w this is going to be very much uh, a competitive kind of a policy, right? So you, school, school teacher realizes if I work at this district and they give you 80% of the money, but if I work over at this school and they only give me 60% of the money, which one do I want to go to? And so there's, that's why this planning and this part is not just in the vacuum of Conroe ISD. It also has to be, we have to look and see what is everybody doing around us because we're all sharing the same and competing for the same workforce. So if I understand correctly, 32,000 may not even be available to Conroe. That may only be available in Breckenridge, Texas. Correct. Or wherever, right. okay? Borger or wherever. We don't even have that rural that situation in Conroe. That's correct. Because it's statewide, right? It's not just. Uh, They'll use census not, blocks. It's not, it's not uh, Galactic. Where the school is located. Right. right. Okay. It's, it's mm -hmm. whatever. Correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we might only qualify at most for like 12,000 or 15,000. I don't know, but you don't know, but whatever. It will actually vary from school to school based okay. on the census blocks. And so if uh, a teacher at Creighton may be eligible to receive a lot more money than a teacher at Gladys to answer your question. And so <coughs> it's going to vary based on where the, st where the students yeah. live that attend that school. And then you've got the variable of who, who decides, could you go back to your original, who decides recognized exemplary or master? Is that a, is that a designation? We do. Or we do? Or? Yes, those, those, are, those are the three designations that you could get, but we define what those will look like at our district, and then we have to have them approved. Right. So, so just to be clear, we're considering not ranking our high school students because competition may be unhealthy, <laughs> but we're going to be required to rank our teachers because competition is healthy. My, and uh, <laughs> I mean, not but, but remember that the, the from, goal from of the, this is the, also the, to try to keep effective teachers just, in challenging schools. So I mean, it kind of overlays with that piece too. I, but so I, I was under the impression say. I don't like ranking teachers. Period, because it's apples and oranges. I mean, a teacher in a special needs classroom versus someone teaching AP English. How do you do that? Someone is teaching in a socioeconomically disadvantaged area versus someone teaching in a little bit more affluent area. How do you? How do you? How do you rank them? It's to get a little bit arbitrary, um, very subjective. So my issue becomes, I was under the impression that if we got schools that are um, a little bit harder to recruit, that we would potentially have funds to offer stipends for teachers teaching in that school. But it doesn't seem like that's what it's addressing. This is more no, complex. That's, not what, this is. that's this. not what this is. This and is a performance so pay. This, this, is, this is performance pay. And, and, and so that, there lies the issue. And I'll get more, we, we will get more complaints once you go to trying to rank teachers. And I think we ever want to yeah. 
you know, along with the, uh, any of the, the teacher aides that they may have in those classrooms helping them achieve that. Exactly. So you get a cut. Well, that's where you go back to part of your plan. You can designate different <coughs> ways of, of distributing the compensation. Yeah, if this is local designation, we could say one of those harder to play schools, give them a different rubric. Yeah, but a different you, school. if you're going to blanket that, I agree. If you say all these teachers here this are This would be a big undertaking. But that's a little bit of a label you put on those, 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 those teachers, and so I don't it know. It says if we participate, like a local designation system, if we participate, we have to come up with something. Yeah, I don't like okay, it. But the option is we don't come up with anything. We, we tell everyone you get nothing. So let me ask you a question. I'd rather give them something than nothing. Would, would a master level, could it be something as simple as, you know, if you have a, a, a post-secondary degree? You know, could it could it be something like that, or is it your accomplishments in the classroom, or both? Because well, you know, we've all had a teacher that was mm -hmm. in the recognized. I mean, let's be honest. I mean, they do exist. It may not be fair to pay them differently. I'm not going to even argue uh, that tonight. But I'm telling you, I've had teachers that belonged in one category and belonged in another. Okay, and um, we've all had them. And I always thought that you know, the, like I said, the competition, the business side of me, whatever performance pay they always said in teachers it would knock out the team effort what well, doesn't knock out the team effort in my office we're salesmen but it doesn't knock out the team effort so why should it knock but anyway that's a different I argument I would say though that that I I think it can be done I just think that the the categories that what de, like you said if you're gonna label somebody as recognized exemplary or master or none or whatever Okay, you better have a, a, a definitive. It may not be subjective. Yeah. And what right. we're what we're hoping for, if you want to click to the next slide, Paul, is we're we're going to go in cohort D, which is the last group to to join into this party. Um, and what we're hoping for is that there's going to there will be right. models out there that will be effective, that we will be able to not have to create yeah. it all here. We'll be able to take um, pieces from effective models and make them work for us, but. Like, uh, is that your like, choice to go? To yes, D? we chose to go to D because there was no way we could manage this any sooner. I mean, we just couldn't make this happen. But, like Dr. Hines mentioned, this is going to be a competitive deal, and to not play is really not an option. Yeah, that's right. Because the state's going to give this money. So, if we chose basically not to do it, and <laughs> all our surrounding districts did, we might find ourselves in a ten thousand dollar deficit for paying teachers. You, or at yeah. least these teachers that have these designations. So yeah. we really can't not play. Yeah, we, really we're just going to have to figure get, out how yeah, to. You get three yeah. until all you all get zero. Yeah, but yeah. My, my concern is that sometimes you take $5, but you end up having to pay 15 because <laughs> you took five. No doubt. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the case. You know? Somebody offered one of my kids $5. That's great. I got three of them. Right. So now I got to kick in another ten because, it, you know, everybody's crying foul and I got I got chaos. I got anarchy. In there. Yeah. No, I, yeah, so I hear that point. And my other point was, um, we talk about school. It's, teaching is subjective. I mean, it's, I had teachers if I graded them at the time, someone would have got straight F's, mm -hmm. right? Um, but when I look back at it at a different lens, you know, different time, um, they actually did that very very well. It's just that. At the time, I didn't like what they were doing, mm -hmm. right? Because it was affecting me directly. And so, when you when you rank teachers, you got principal on campus that have their cliques, which they do, very biased in some instances. Mm -hmm. Certain teachers that are a little bit more friendly to them because you grade those, they have to give them reports and so forth. They grade those principals, and and so the principals understand the cliques and who likes them, who don't. And and coincidentally, the grading system comes out that way, all right? This teacher is exemplary. Not so great in the classroom, but the teacher likes the principal likes them. That's why right. I said it's subjective. Mm -hmm. you know, I, mean, so yeah. I think that's a slippery slope in itself. But like you said, I, I appreciate you guys taking last bat at this deal so you can kind of figure out what works and what doesn't work. But I would just be cautious in some of those some of those pitfalls that I just laid out. Agreed. That's what you're talking about. You also have two legislative meetings. Yes, and that, yeah. was, that, that was part of it, too, is... The, you know, they put good. funding out there for this round, but it could also go away in two years. So yeah. we we didn't want to spend, you know, yeah. too much time building something that then goes away <laughs> a year and a half from now because the legislature decides to take it away. So we tried to be as smart about it, and <laughs> cohort D seemed to make the most sense uh, timeline-wise for us. All right, Nanny, you know, if it's about getting the money, mm -hmm. just rank everybody the same. Get the money. 
Well, not, I mean, I asked that question. Not yeah. not like, what's going to stop some district from creating a system that every one of their teachers becomes exemplary and they get an influx of money and just pay everybody more money? That's where CEA and I guess Texas Tech are really going to have to define mm -hmm. how we measure it. And they're going to have to put measurables on it because subject, subjectivity is not going to work. Agree. The, I was just going to mention that one of the other components of this right now is it appears that yeah. teachers, once they get this rating or this designation it follows them so that's another reason we have to uh, prepare so that so, so even if, if we don't play even, they're coming if they come here we would still be we would have to recognize their designation even if their designation was made under different criteria than what we designate correct Correct. Like yeah, you're exemplary or whatever, but you're horrible here. Wow. But we're gonna recognize. We can't redesignate them <laughs> as of the way the rules are now. <laughs> that, could, that could change. But right now, it's like a five-year <laughs> designation. And it becomes so. A part if they of came the here during that five years, we would have to recognize. Because unless it is something absolutely definitive, like you're a master teacher if you have a master's or higher degree. I'm I'm just using that as an example, not that that's a reason to make somebody a master. But unless it's something like that. You could have somebody that was a master teacher that, you know, something in their life changed and they, for whatever reason, they became worthless. Okay, and you don't, you're telling me you can't change their pay or their or their or their account of it's, or their. It's, it's like black belts and karate, but we got reciprocity. You got to recognize that black belt from that. that well, you know what I'm saying is, if it's truly for, for performance, they got to maintain that performance, or there's got to be some. Pay it back. The, the, right. You know, I mean. It works both ways, mm -hmm. okay? A salesman makes more money than a salaried person, but they got to sell to make that money. Yeah. There's always the other side to it. Yeah. And this is just one of those things that's very early. Very early. Yeah. Those both things, House part. Bill 3, we're just learning. We're, we have very little information yet. We're, we're starting the process. Good stuff. Great job, like that, ladies and gentlemen. Well, that's our, sure. our timeline. That's it. Anything else? Here's the timeline. I mean, we're working. <laughs> yeah. Great we've job. Done all that Any other questions tonight? Gentlemen, I know we, it's been a lot of information we've thrown at you uh, here in the last couple hours, but anything else that we can do for you? Uh, oh, thanks for all the work that you guys do. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.